Bridge Audio presents Beer by L. Ron Hubbard. Lurking that lovely spring day in the office of Dr. Chalmers at Worthy College Medical Clinic, there might have been two small spirits of the air pressed back into the dark shadow behind the door, avoiding as far as possible the warm sunlight which fell gently upon the rug. Professor Lowry, buttoning his shirt, said, So, I'm good for another year, am I? Oh, for another 38 years, smiled Dr. Chalmers. A fellow with a rugged build like yours doesn't have to worry much about a thing like malaria. Not even the best variety of bug Yucatan could offer. You, or you'll have a few chills, of course, but nothing to worry about. By the way, when are you going back to Mexico? If I go when my wife gives me leave, that'll be never. And if I had a woman as lovely as your wife Mary, said Chalmers, Yucatan could go and give its malaria to somebody else. Oh, well. And he tried to make himself believe he was not, after all, envious of Atworthy's wandering ethnologist. I never could see what you fellows saw in strange lands and places. Facts, said Lowry. Oh, yes, I suppose. Facts about primitive sacrifice and demons and devils. Say, by the way, that was a very nice article you had in the newspaper weekly last Sunday. The door moved slightly, though it might have been caused by the cool breath of verdure which came in the window. Oh, thank you, said Lowry, trying not to look too pleased. Of course, said young Chalmers, you were rather sticking out your neck. You had your friend Tommy frothing about such insolence. He's very fond of his demons and devils, you know. <laughs> he likes to pose, said Lowry. But how do you mean sticking out my neck? Well, you haven't been here much under Jebson, said Chalmers. He nearly crucified a young mathematician for using Atworthy's name in a scientific magazine. But then maybe our beloved president didn't see it. I can't imagine the old stuff shirt reading the newspaper weekly anyway. Oh, said Lowry, I thought you meant about my denying the existence of such things. Oh, well, maybe I meant that too, said Chalmers. I guess we're all superstitious savages at heart. And when you come out in bold-faced type and ridicule ancient belief that demons cause sickness and woe, and when you throw dirt, so to speak, in the faces of luck and fate, you must be very, very sure of yourself. Why shouldn't I be sure of myself, said Lowry, smiling. Did anyone ever meet a spirit of any sort face to face? I mean, of course, that there aren't any authenticated cases on record anywhere. Not even, said Chalmers, the visions of saints. Well, anyone who starves himself long enough can see visions. Still, said Chalmers, when you offer so wildly as to present your head in a basket to the man who can show you a sure enough demon, and my head in a basket he shall have, said Lowry. For a man of science, you talk very weirdly, old fellow. I've been in a psychiatric ward often enough, said Chalmers. At first I used to think it was the patient, and then after a while I began to wonder. You know, demons are supposed to come out with the full moon. You ever watch a whole psychopathic ward go stark raving mad during the three days that a moon is full? Nonsense. Oh, perhaps. Chalmers, I tried in that article to show how people begin to believe in supernatural agencies and how scientific explanation has at last superseded vague terror. Now, don't come along and tell me that you can cast some doubt on those findings. Oh, and Chalmers began to laugh. We both know that truth is an abstract quantity uh, that probably doesn't exist. Yet go crusading against your devils and your demons, Professor Lowry, and if they get mad at you, argue them out of existence. I myself don't say they exist. It merely strikes me strangely that man's lot could be so consistently unhappy without something somewhere aiding in that misery. And if it's because electrons vibrate at certain speeds, or if it's because the spirits of air and earth and water are jealous of any comfort or happiness that man might have, I neither know nor care. But how comforting it is to knock on wood when one has made a brag. And so, said Lowry, slipping into his top coat, the goblins are going to get me if I don't watch out. <laughs> They'll get you all right if Jebson saw that article, said Chalmers. The door moved ever so little. But then... Perhaps it was just the cool, sweet breath of spring whispering through the window. Lowry, swinging his stick, went out into the sunlight. Oh, I felt good to be home. The place looked and smelled good, too. 
For beyond the change of the seasons, uh, there was never any difference in this town, never any real difference in the students. And when the college built a new building, why it always looked the same somehow, old and mellow before it was half completed. There was a sleepy sameness to the place, which was soothing to one whose eyes had been so long tortured by the searching glare of spinning sun on brassy sand. No, little ever changed in this quiet and contented mecca of education. Twenty-five years ago, Franklin Lowry, his father, strolled down this same street. Twenty-five years before that, Ezekiel Lowry had done so. And each has done so, not once, but on almost every day of his mature life, and then, dead, had been carried in a hearse along this way. He supposed, walking down the warmth of the new sun, he too would keep on walking down the street, past these stores with pennants in the windows, past these students in bright jackets, past these old elms at ancient walls, and he too would probably be carried in a hearse over this pavement to a resting place beside his letter burden forefathers. He was fortunate, he told himself. He had a lovely lady for a wife. He had an honest and wise gentleman for a friend. He had a, a respected position and some small reputation as an ethnologist. Ah, oh, what of a slight touch of malaria. That would pass. What if men did not understand so long as they were respectful and even kind? Life was good and worth living. What more could one ask? Professor Lowry, sir, it was an anemic-looking book delver assistant to an assistant in some department. But yeah. The young man was a little out of breath, and he took a moment or two standing there and wringing a wretched cap in his hands to better talk clearly. Sir, Mr. Jepson saw you pass by, and he sent me after you. He wants to see you, sir. Thank you, said Lowry, turning and retracing his steps until he came to the curving pathway which led up to the officer's. He did not wonder very greatly at being summoned, for he was not particularly afraid of Jepson. Presidents had come and gone at Atworthy, and some of them had peculiar ideas. That Jepson was somewhat on the stuffy side was nothing to worry about. The girl in the outer office jumped up and opened the door for him with a muttered, Oh, he'll see you right now, sir. And Lowry went in. Jepson was looking out of the window as though his inattention there might result in a collapse of the entire scene visible from it. He did not look around, but he said, Be seated, Lowry. Lowry sat, regarding the president. The man was very thin and white and old, so stiff he looked more like plaster than flesh. And each passing year had dug a little deeper in the austere lines which furrowed his rather unkindly face. Jepson was motionless, for it was his pride that he had no nervous habits. Lowry waited. Jepson at last opened a drawer and took out a newspaper which was partly printed in colour. This he laid out before him with great care, moving his pen stand so that it would lie smoothly. Lowry, until then, had felt peaceful. He had forgotten her completely and utterly, that article in the newspaper weekly. But even so, he relaxed again, for certainly there was nothing wrong in that. Lowry, said Jepson, taking a sip of water, which must have been white vinegar from the face he made, and then holding the glass before his face as he continued, Lowry, we have stood a great deal from you. Lowry sat straighter. He retreated to the far depths of himself and regarded Jepson from out of the great shadows of his eyes. You've been needed here, said Jepson, and yet you chose to wander in some lost and irretrievable land, consorting with the ungodly and scratching for knickknacks like a dog looking for a bone he's buried and forgotten. Jepson was a little astonished at his own fluent flight of simile and paused, uh, but he went on in a moment. Atworthy has financed you when Atworthy should not have financed anything but new buildings. Atworthy or has not built on nonsense. Well, I found more than enough to pay for my own expeditions, ventured Lowry. Those money grants were refunded three years ago. No mind. We are here to develop the intelligence and youth of great nation, not to exhume the mouldering bones of the heathen civilization. I am no ethnologist. I have little sympathy with ethnology. I can understand that a man might utilize such play as a hobby, but holding as I do that man is wholly a product of his own environment, 
I cannot see that a study of pagan customs furnish any true right by which to understand mankind. Yeah, very well. You know my opinions in this matter. We teach ethnology, and you are the chair in anthropology and ethnology. I have no quarrel with learning of any kind, but I do have quarrel with a fixation. Oh, I am sorry, said Lowry. And I am sorry, said Jepson, in the tone a master inquisitor of the Inquisition might have used condemning a prisoner to an order de fe. I refer, of course, to this article. By what leave, may I ask, was it written? Why, floundered poor Lowry, I had no idea that I was doing wrong. It seemed to me that the function of the scholar is to give his learning to those who might use it. The function of the scholar has nothing to do with this, Lowry. Nothing whatever to do with this. This wretched rag is a brand. It is trash. It is stuff that lies under the name of scientific fact and has done more harm for the cause of truth than fascism itself. And he stated ominously, lowering his tone, this morning I was confronted with the name of Atworthy in such a place. If a student had not brought it to me, I might never have seen it at all. There it is, there by Professor James Lowry. Worthy college. Jepson bent over it and adjusted his glasses upon the thin bridge of his nose. Mankind's mental ills might in part be due to the phantoms of the witch doctors of yesterday. <laughs> and Professor James Lowry, ethnologist at Worthy College. You will be writing about demonology next. As something which one and all should believe. Oh, this is disgraceful. The entire town is talking about it. Lowry had managed to control his shaking hands and now erased the quiver from his throat which sought to block his voice. This is not an article about demonology, sir. It is an attempt to show people that their superstitions and many of their fears grew out of yesterday's erroneous beliefs. I have sought to show that demons and devils were invented to allow some cunning member of the tribe to gain control of his fellows by the process of inventing something for them to fear and then offering to act as interpreter. Yeah, I have read it, said Jefferson. I have read it and I see more in it than you would like me to see. Prating of demons and devils and the placating of gods of fear by your very influence, sir. I suddenly conceive you to mean religion itself. Next, I suppose, he will attack Christianity as an invention to overthrow the Roman capitalistic state. But, began Lowry, and then, turning red again, held his tongue and retreated even further into himself. This wild beration of demons and devils, said Jebson, reads like a protest of your own mind against the belief which association with the ungodly and unwashed of far lands might have instilled in you yourself. You made yourself ludicrous. You have brought mockery on and worthy. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot readily forgive this, Lowry. In view of the circumstance, I can find no saving excuse for you except that you desire money and gained it at the expense of the honor and esteem in which this institution is held. There are just two months left of this school year. Now we cannot dispense with you until the year is done, but not after that, said Jepson, crumbling up the paper and tossing it into the wastebasket. I'm afraid you will have to look for other employment. Lowry started up with a better record. I, I might have forgiven, but your record well, has never been good. Lowry, you'll go back to the forgotten parts of the world and, and resume your commune with the ungodly. <laughs> good day. Lowry walked out, not even seeing the girl who opened the doors for him. He forgot to replace his hat until he was on the walk. He'd wandered several blocks before he came to himself. Dully, he wondered if he had a class. And then he recalled that it was Saturday and that he had not Saturday classes. Vaguely, he remembered having been on his way to attend a meeting or to have luncheon. No, it could not have been luncheon for it was evidently about two, according to the sun. And then the nudge of thought itself was swallowed 
in the wave of recollection. He was shivering, and it brought him around to thinking about himself for a moment. He mustn't shiver, because this world for him had come to an abrupt end. There were other colleges which might be glad to have him, and there were millionaires who had offered to finance him, seeing that his traveling returned the investment and more. No, 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 he should not feel so badly. And yet he shivered as though stripped naked to a winter's blast. Poor Mary, she loved this world of tease and respect. She'd been brought up in this town, and all her memories and friendships were here. She failed to understand Jebson, for he was too generous to be able to run the gamut of Jebson's thought process, starting with the little man's desire to injure the big one, and envy for Lowry's rather romantic and mysterious aspect, passing through the indirect insult to the college, and finally coming to light as a challenge to Christianity itself in some weird and half-understood way. Poor Mary. Poor, beautiful, sweet Mary. He'd always wanted to appear grand to her, to make up somehow for being so many years older than she, and now he had brought her disgrace and separation from that which she knew best. Again, he had the recollection of having an appointment somewhere, but again, he could not remember. The wind was chill now and tugged at his hat, and the clouds which swept their shadows over the pavement were darker still. He looked about him and found that he was within reach of an old house with iron deer before it, the home of Professor Tommy Williams, who, for all his bachelorhood, maintained his family place alone. Feeling strangely as though all had not yet happened to him and experiencing the need of shelter and company, he walked swiftly to the place and turned up the walk. The mansion seemed to repel him as he stared at it, for the two gable windows were uncommonly like a pince nez sitting on the nose of a mouldering judge. For an instant he hesitated, almost turned around and went away. And then he had the mental image of Tommy, the one man in this world to whom he could talk, having been the one kid with whom he had associated as a boy. But if he had come out of his boyhood with a shy reticence, Tommy had chosen another lane. For Tommy Williams was the joy of his students and the campus. Oh, he traveled much in the old countries and therefore brought to this place an air of the cosmopolitan, a gay disregard for convention and frumpy thought. Tommy Williams loved to dabble with the exotic and fringe the forbidden, to drink special teas with weird foreign names and read cabalistic books. He told fortunes out of crystal balls at charity affairs and loved to eye his client afterward with a sly, sideways look, as though outwardly this must all be in fun, but inwardly, inwardly, mightn't it be true? Oh, Tommy was all laughter, froth and lightness, with London styles and Parisian wit, a man too clever to have any enemies, or very many friends. Now, he need not pause here on the threshold of Tommy's home. Oh, it would be good to talk to Tommy. Tommy would cheer him and tell him that old Jebson was, at his finest, a pompous old ass. He mounted the steps and let the knocker drop. He dropped the knocker again, more anxious than before to be admitted to the warmth of fire and friendship. His teeth were beginning to chatter, and he had a sick, all gone sensation where his stomach should have been. Malaria, he asked himself. <sighs> yes, he had just come from Chalmers, who had called these chills malaria. He had not two hours ago peered into a microscope where his basically stained blood was spread out so that they could see the little globes inside some of the red corpuscles. But malaria wasn't dangerous, merely uncomfortable. Yes, this must be malarial chill, and shortly it would pass. He had, once more, the idea that he had an engagement somewhere, and pondered for an instant, trying to pull forth the reluctant fact from some stubborn recess no, he wouldn't keep standing here. The houses were never locked in this town, and Tommy, even if he was at home, would welcome him eagerly when he did return. He pushed open the door and closed it behind him. It was dim in the hall, dim, with collected years and forgotten events, with crepe long crumbled and bridal bouquets withered to dust, and smoky with childish shouts and the coughing of old men. Somewhere, 
there was a scurrying sound, as though a scholarly rat had been annoyed at his gnawing upon some learned tome. To the right, the double doors opened portentously upon the living room, and Lowry, sensing a fire there, approached, hat in hand. He was astonished. Tommy Williams lay upon the sofa, one arm dangling, one foot higher than the other, and both feet higher than his head. His shirt was open, and he wore neither tie nor coat. For an instant, Lowry thought, he must be dead. And then Tommy yawned and started to stretch. But in the middle of the action, he sensed his visitor and came groggily to his feet, blinking and massaging his eyes and looking again. <laughs> Heavens, man, said Tommy. You gave me a start for a moment. Oh, I was sound asleep. I'm sorry, said Lowry, feeling unnecessary. I, I thought you were gone and that I might wait until you... Oh, well, of course, said Tommy. I I've slept too long anyway. What time is it? Lowry glanced at the great hall clock. But five minutes after two... Well, that shows you what all play and no sleep will do to a fellow. Here, give me your hat. Get warm by the fire. Oh, Lord, I've never seen a man look quite so blue. Is it, is it as cold as that out? I seem to be a little cold, said Lowry. Malaria, I guess. He felt a little better. Tommy seemed so glad to see him, and he moved across the room to where two logs smoldered on the grate. Tommy came by him and stirred them into a cheerful glow and then busied himself by the liquor cabinet putting a drink together. You've got to take better care of yourself, old fellow, said Tommy. We've only won Professor Lowry at Atworthy, and we can't run the risk of losing him. Here, take this. You'll feel better. Tommy was sitting on the edge of the sofa now. He always sat, as though expecting to arise in another instant. He was lighting a cigarette, but he stared so long at Lowry that the match burned his fingers, and he dropped it and placed the tips in his mouth. Presently, he forgot about the sting and succeeded in applying the fire. Something is wrong, Jim. Lowry looked at him and drank again. It's Jepson. He found an article of mine in the newspaper weekly, and he's raving mad about it. He'll recover, said Tommy with a rather loud laugh. He'll recover, said Lowry, but just now I'm wondering if I will. What's this? I'm being ousted at the end of the term. Why? Oh, the old fool. Jimmy can't mean it. will it will take an order from the board. He controls the board, and he can do that. I've got to find another job. Oh, Jim, look, you've got to straighten this out. Look, Jepson has never liked you, true. And he's muttered a great deal about you behind your back. You are too blunt, Jim. But he can't let you go this way. Why, everyone will be furious. They discussed the matter for a little while, and then, at last, a sort of hopelessness began to enter their tones. And then their sentences became desultory, to finally drop into a silence marked only by the occasional pop of the wood. Tommy walked around the room with a restive grace, pausing by the whatnot stand to pick up a china elephant. Tossing the fragile beast with a quick, nervous motion, he turned back to Lowry. There was a queer, strained grin on Tommy's lips, but bleakness in his eyes. It would seem, said Tommy, that your article has begun to catch up with you. Well, that is rather obvious. No, 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 don't ever accuse me of being obvious, Jim. I meant the article was about demons and devils and tended to mock them as having any power. Tommy, said Lowry, with one of his occasional smiles, they should put you to teaching demonology. You almost believe in it. When creeds fail, one must turn somewhere, said Tommy jokingly. Or oh, was it jokingly? You say the gods of luck are false. You wrote that it's silly to seek the aid of gods beyond the aid of the one supreme god. You said that demons and devils were the manufacture of Machiavellian witch doctors and that men could only be herded by the fear of those things they could not see. You said that men thought they found a truly good world to be an evil world in their blindness, and so built a hideous structure of phantoms to people their nightmares. <laughs> yeah, what if I did, said Lowry? It is true. The world is not evil. The air and water and earth are not peopled with jealous beings anxious to undermine the happiness of man. Tommy put the elephant back and perched himself on the edge of the couch. He was visibly agitated. 
and kept his eyes down, pretending to inspect his immaculate nails. No man knows, Jim. Lowry rumbled out a short laugh and said, Oh, tell me now that you are so studied in these things that you actually credit a possibility of their existence? Jim, the world to you has always been a good place. That's a sort of mechanical reaction by which you like to forget all the ghastly things the world has done to you. You should be more like me, Jim. I know the world is an evil, capricious place, and that men are basically bad. And so, knowing that, I'm always pleased to find some atom of goodness, and only bored to see something evil. You, on the other hand, march forward relentlessly into sorrow and disappointment. To you, all things are good. And when you find something which is mean and black and slimy, you are revolted. And you've come to me today, shivering, as with the ague, wrapped by a treacherous turn, done you by a man you should initially have thought good. That view of yours, Jim, will never bring you anything but misery and tears, phantoms or not. That man is the safest who knows that all is really evil, and the air and earth and water are peopled by fantastic demons and devils who lurk to grin at and increase the sad state of man. And so, said Lowry, am I to bow low to superstition and re-inherit all the gloomy thoughts of my benighted ancestors? Oh, devil, take your devils, Tommy Williams. I'll have nothing to do with them. But it would appear, said Tommy, in a quiet, even, ominous way, that they will have something of you. How can you arrive at that? It would appear, said Tommy, that the devils and demons have won their first round. Bah, said Lowry, but a chill coursed through him. You said they do not exist in an article in the newspaper weekly. That same article arouses the rage of a vindictive fool and thereby causes your scheduled dismissal from Atworthy. Nonsense, said Lowry, but less briskly. Be nice. And say the world is an evil place, filled with evil spirits. Be nice and forget your knightly manner. Yeah, and now be nice and go home and fill yourself with quinine and rest. And I came to you for solace, said Lowry with a smile. To solace is to lie, said Tommy. I gave you better than that. Devils and demons. Wisdom. Lowry walked slowly into the hall the chill making it difficult for him to speak clearly. Confounded, he was certain that he had an appointment somewhere this afternoon. He could almost recall the times a quarter to three, and the old clock was chiming that now. He reached forward toward the rack, where his hat lay in a thick mass of coats and canes. It was dusk at the twilight's end. All along the street, windows were lighted and people could be seen through some of them, people with talk and food in their mouths. The wind had picked up along the earth and brought a great gout of white scurrying out of the dark. A newspaper. High above, a cool moon looked out now and then through rifts of anxiously fleeing clouds and now and again a star blinked briefly beyond the torn masses of blue and black and silver. Where was he? The street sign said Elm and Locust Avenues, which meant that he was only half a block from Tommy's house and about a block from his own. He looked worriedly at his watch by the sphere of yellow in the middle of the street and found that it was a quarter to seven. A quarter to seven. The chill took him, and all his teeth castaneted briefly until he made his jaw relax. He felt for his hat, but it was gone. And he felt panicky about the loss of his hat and cast anxiously about to see if it lay anywhere near. A group of students strolled by, a girl flattered by the teasing of the three boys about her. One of them nodded respectfully to Lowry. A quarter to three. A quarter to seven. Four hours. Where had he been? Tommy's, that was it. Tommy's. But he left there at a quarter to three. And it was now 
a quarter to seven. Four hours. He'd never been really drunk in his whole life. But he knew that when one drank indiscreetly, there usually followed a thick head and a raw stomach. And as nearly as he could remember, he'd had only that one drink at Tommy's, and certainly one drink was not enough to blank his mind. Oh, it was horrible having lost four hours. But just why it was horrible, he could not understand. Where had he gone? Had he seen anyone? Would somebody come up to him on the morrow and say, that was a fine talk you gave at the club, Professor Lowry. Well, it wasn't malaria. Malaria, in its original state, might knock a man out, but even in delirium, a man knew where he was. And he certainly had no symptoms of having been delirious. No, he hadn't been drunk, and it wasn't malaria. He began to walk rapidly toward his home. He had a gnawing ache inside him, which he could not define. And he carried along that miserable sensation of near memory, which goes with words which refuse to come, but halfway into consciousness. Oh, if, if he only tried a little harder, he would know where he had been. The night was ominous to him, and it was all that he could do to keep his pace sane. Every tree and bush was a lurking shape which might at any moment materialize into... Into, with the name of God, what was wrong with him? Could it be that he was afraid of the dark? Eagerly, he turned into his own walk. For all that he could see, the ancient mansion slept, holding deep shadows close to it like its memories of a lost youth. He halted for a moment at the foot of the steps, wondering a little that he saw no light in the front of the house, but then perhaps Mary had grown alarmed at his failure to come home and had gone to his office. No, she would have phoned. A clamoring alarm began to go within him. Abruptly, a shriek stabbed from the blackness. Jim! Oh, my God, Jim! He vaulted the steps and nearly broke the door down as he entered. For a moment he paused, irresolute, in the hall, casting madly about him, straining to catch the sound of Mary's voice again. There was nothing but silence and memory in this house. He leaped up the wide stairway to the second floor, throwing on lights with hungry fingers as he went. He glanced through all the rooms on the second floor without result and sprang up the narrow, debris-strewn stairs to the attic. It was dismal here and the wind was moaning about the old tower, and trunks crouched like black beasts in the gloom. He lighted a match, and the old familiar shapes leaped up to reassure him. She was not here. Trembling, he made his way down to again examine the rooms on the second floor. He was beginning to feel sick in his stomach, and his blood was two sledgehammers knocking out his temples from within. He had lighted everything as he had come up, and the light itself seemed harsh to him, harsh and unkindly, in that it revealed an empty house. Could she have gone next door? Or was there a dinner somewhere that she had had to attend without him? Yes, that must be it. A note somewhere, probably beside his chair, on the dining room table, in the kitchen, on his study desk, on the mantelpiece. No, there wasn't any note. He sank down on the couch in his study and cupped his face in his hands. He tried to order himself and stop quivering. He tried to fight down the nausea, which was, he knew, all terror. Why was he allowing himself to become so upset? She must not have gone very far. And if she had not left a note, why right then she intended to be back shortly. Nothing could happen to anyone in this lazy, monotonous town. Her absence made him feel acutely what life would mean without her. He had been a beast, leaving her and running away to far lands, leaving her to this lonely old place and the questionable kindness of faculty friends. Life without her would be an endless succession of purposeless days lived with a heavy hopelessness. For minutes he sat there trying to calm himself, trying to tell himself that there was nothing wrong. And after a little, he did succeed in inducing a state of mind which, if not comfortable, at least allowed him to stop shivering. 
the outer door slammed, and quick footsteps sounded in the hall. Lowry leaped up and ran to the door. She was hanging up her new fur wrap. Mary! She looked at him in surprise. So much had he put into the word. But there you are, Jim Lowry, you vagabond. Where were you all this time? But he wasn't listening to her. His arms were almost crushing her, and he was laughing with happiness. She laughed with him, even though he was completely ruining the set of her hair and crumpling the snowy collar of her dress. You're beautiful, said Lowry. You're lovely and wonderful and grand, and I, if I didn't have you, I would walk right out and step over a cliff. Well, you better not. You're the only woman in the world. You're sweet and loyal and good. Mary's face was glowing, and her eyes, when she pushed him back a little to look up at him, were gentle. You're an old bear, Jim. Now account for yourself. Where have you been? Why? And he stopped, feeling very uneasy. I don't know, Mary. Oh, let me smell your breath. No, I wasn't drunk. But you're shivering, Jim. Have you gotten malaria again? And here you are walking around when you should be in bed. No, no, I'm all right. I, really, I'm all right. Mary, where were you? Out looking for you. I'm sorry I worried you. She shrugged. Worry me a little now and then, and I'll know how much I worship you. But here we are gabbing, and you haven't had anything to eat. Look, I'll get you something immediately. He ate slowly, relaxing little by little, until he was half sprawled on the lounge. And then a thought brought him upright again. When I came in here, I heard screams. Screams? Suddenly you sounded like you were calling to me. Oh, it must have been the Allison radio. Those kids can find the most awful program, and they haven't the least idea of tuning them down. The whole family must be deaf. Oh, yes, I guess you're right. It, it gave me the most awful scare. He relaxed again and just looked at her. She had very provocative eyes, dark and languorous, so that when she gave him a slow look, he could feel little tingles of pleasure go through him. Oh, what a fool he was to go away from her. She was so young and so lovely. He wondered what she had ever seen in an old fool like himself. Well, of course, there were only about ten years between them, and he had lived outdoors so much that he didn't look so very much over thirty-one or thirty-two. Still, when he sat like this, studying her sweet face and the delicate roundness of her body and seeing the play of firelight in her dark hair and feeling the caress of her eyes, he could not wholly understand why she had ever begun to love him at all. Mary, who could have had her choice from 50 men, who'd even been courted by Tommy Williams, what did she see in a burly, clumsy, granite being like himself? For a moment he was panicky at the thought that some day she might grow tired of his silences, his long absences. Mary. Yes, Jim. Mary, do you love me a little bit? <laughs> a lot more than a little bit, Jim Lowry. Mary. Yes. Yeah. Tommy once asked you to marry him, didn't he? A slight displeasure crossed her face. But any man that can carry on an affair with a student and still ask me to marry him, Jim, <laughs> don't be jealous again. I thought we'd put all that away long ago. But you married me instead. You're strong and powerful and everything a woman wants in a man, Jim. Women find beauty in men only when they find strength. There's something wrong with a woman, Jim, when she falls in love with a fellow because he's pretty. Thank you, Mary. And now, Mr. Lowry, I think you had better get yourself to bed before you fall asleep on that couch. <laughs> Just a little longer. No. She got up and pulled him to his feet. You're half on fire and half frozen. Look, and when you get these hangovers, the best thing for you is bed. I could never see what pleasure a man could get out of wandering off to some land just so he could roast in the sun and let a bug bite him. To bed with you, Mr. Lowry. He let her force him up the stairs and into his room, and then he gave her a long kiss and a hug sufficient to break her ribs before he let her return to the living room. He felt very comfortable inside as he undressed and was almost on the verge of singing something as he hung up his suit when he noticed 
a large tear on the collar. He inspected it more closely. Yes, and there were other tears, and the cloth was all wrinkled and stiff in spots as if from mud. Oh, we could grief, the suit was ruined. He puzzled over it, and then, in disgust for having destroyed good English tweeds, he crammed jacket and trousers into the bottom of a clothes hamper. As he got into his pajamas, he mused over what a lovely person Mary really was. She hadn't called his attention to it, and yet he must have looked a perfect wreck. He washed his hands and face in an absent sort of way, musing over how he could have wrecked his suit. He dried himself upon a large bath towel and was about to slip on his pajama coat when he was shocked to see something which looked like a brand on his forearm. It was not very large, and there was no pain in it. Interested, he held his arm closer to the light. The thing was scarlet, a scarlet mark not unlike a tattoo. And what a strange shape it had, like the foot pads of a small dog, one, two, three, four, four little pads, as though a small animal had walked there. But there were few dogs that small, but more like a rabbit. Strange, he told himself. He went into his room and turned out the light. Strange. He eased in between the covers and plumped up his pillow. A mark like the footprint of a rabbit. How could he have torn his suit and stained it with mud? What could have put this stamp upon his arm? Oh, a chill came over him, and he found it difficult to stop his jaw muscles from contracting. The cool moon's light was blue, and the wind found a crack under the door and began to moan a dismal dirge. The sound was not constant, but built slowly from a whisper into a round groan, and then into a shriek, finally dying again into a sigh. And lying there, Jim Lowry thought there was a voice in it. He twisted about and attempted to cover up his right ear, burrowing his left into the pillow. But fears, sadistic fingers, reached in and found his heart and ached its regular rhythm to send his blood coursing in his throat. Just the moan of the wind under a door and the protest of the curtains and the rattle of the sash and the moon's cold blue light upon the bottom of his bed. The door opened slowly, and the curtain streamed straight out as the wind leaped into the room from the window. The door banged, and the wall shivered, and a white shape was moving slowly toward him on soundless feet, and a white face gleamed dully above a glittering knife. Nearer and nearer. Lowry sprang savagely at it and knocked the knife away. But it was Mary. Mary stood there, looking at him in hurt amazement, her hand empty, but still upheld. Jim! He was shaking with horror at the thought he might have hurt her. Weakly, he sank upon the edge of the bed. And yet there was relief in him, too. A broken glass lay upon the rug when she turned on the light, and a white pool of warm milk steamed in the cold air. She held her hand behind her, and, with sudden suspicion, he dragged it forth, he had struck the glass so hard that it had cut her. He pulled a small hand to the light and anxiously extracted a broken fragment from the cut and then applied his lips to it to make it bleed more freely. He opened a drawer and took out his expedition first aid kit and found some antiseptic and bandages. She seemed to be far more anxious about him than about her hand. Mary. Yes. He pulled her down on the edge of the bed and threw part of the spread about her shoulders. Oh, Mary, something awful has happened to me. I didn't tell you. There are two things I didn't tell you. Jetson found that newspaper weekly article, and at the end of this term, I'm going to be dismissed. We'll, 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 we'll have to leave at Worthy. Is that all, Jim? Oh, I don't care about this place. Anywhere you go, I'll go. She was almost laughing. I guess you'll have to drag me along, no matter how deep the jungles are, Jim. Yes, yeah. you can go with me, Mary. I was a fool never to have allowed it before. Oh, you must have been terribly lonely here. Oh, I'm always lonely without you, Jim. He kissed her and felt that this must be the way a priest might feel touching the foot of his goddess. And the other thing, Jim? I don't know, Mary. I have no idea... 
where I was between a quarter of three and a quarter of seven. Four hours gone out of my life. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't delirious. Four hours, Mary. Maybe it fell, struck something. But there is no bruise. I feel as if, well, I feel as if something horrible has happened to me and that well, something even more horrible is going to happen soon. I don't know what it is. If I could only find out. Lie down and sleep, Jim. No, I can't sleep. I, I'm going out and walk, and maybe the exercise will clear my head and I'll remember. But you are ill. I can't lie here any longer. I can't stay still. The night was clean and clear, and as he poised for a moment on the top of the steps, the smell of fresh earth and growing things came to him and reawakened his memories. It was the kind of night that makes a child want to run and run forever out across the field to feel the earth fly from beneath his feet, driven by the incomprehensible joy of just being alive. On such a night, he and Tommy had once visited a cave a mile out of town, which was supposed to be haunted, and had succeeded in frightening themselves out of their wits by beholding a white shape, which had turned out to be an old and lonely horse. The memory of it revived Lowry, Tommy's fantastic imagination and his glib tongue. Oh, how Tommy loved to devil his slower and more practical friend. That had just been devilment today, witches and spooks and old wives' tales, devils and demons and black magic. How Tommy, who believed in nothing, liked to pretend to beliefs which would shock people. How he adored practically knocking his students out of their seats by leaning over his desk and saying in a mysterious voice, to be polite, we call it psychology. But in reality, you know and I know that we are studying the black goblins and fiendish ghouls which lie in pretended slumber just out of sight of our conscious minds. How he loved such simile. Of course, what he said was true, absolutely true, but Tommy had to choose that way of putting it. It was such a dull world, so drab. Why not enliven it a little and stick pins into people's imaginations? <laughs> Indeed, dear Tommy, why not? The top of his head was cold, and he reached up to discover that he had forgotten his hat, and, discovering that, remembered that he had lost it. Because his gear was mainly tropical, he had only one belt hat, and one did not walk around Atworthy in a solar toby, not Atworthy. The loss of it troubled him, and his best twee ruined beyond repair. But then his hat had his name in the band, being a good hat, and some student would find it where the wind had taken it and return it to the dean's office. Still, there was something wrong in that. There was deeper significance to having lost his hat. Something actually symbolic of his four lost hours. Part of him was gone. Four hours had been snatched ruthlessly from his life, and with them had gone a feathered hat. It struck him that if he could find the hat, he could also find four hours. Strange indeed that anything should so perplex him, the man whom little had perplexed. Four hours gone. His hat gone. He had the uneasy feeling that he ought to walk along the street toward Tommy's and see if the hat was there under a bush. Oh, it seemed a shame to leave a good hat on some lawn. It might rain. Oh, yes, most certainly. He had better find that hat. He started down the steps to the walk, glancing up at the hurrying fleece between Earth and the moon. He had been down these steps thousands of times. When he reached the bottom, he almost broke his leg on an extra step. He stared at his feet. It hastily backed up swiftly to discover that he could not retreat. He almost fell over backward into space. There were not steps above him, only a descent of them below him. Glassy-eyed, he looked down the flight, trying to take in such a length of steps. Now and then, they faded a little as they went through a dark mist. But 
there was no clue whatever of what might lie waiting at the bottom. He looked anxiously overhead and was relieved to find that the moon was still there. He was standing so that his eyes were above the level of the yard and he felt that he could reach over to the indefinite rim and somehow pull himself out. He reached, but the rim jerked away from him and he almost fell. Breathless, he stared down the flight to the mystery. The moon, the steps, and no connection between himself and the porch. Somewhere, he thought he heard a tinkle of laughter and glared about, but it was evidently nothing more than a set of Japanese wind chimes on the porch. Somehow, he knew that he dared not reach the bottom, that he had not sanity enough to face the awful thing which waited there. But then, all he had to do was to send two more steps and he would be able to reach up to the rim and haul himself forth. He descended, the rim retreated. There was no way to go about it, he told himself, glancing at his empty hands. Yet he would back up. Again, he almost went over backward, into a void. The two steps that he had descended had vanished away from his very heels. There was that laughter again. Nope. Just the sweet cording of the wind chimes. He peered down the angle of the flight, through the strata of dark mist, into a well of ink. Wait. Yeah. There was a door down there, on the side of the flight, not thirty steps below him. That door must lead out and up again. Or the very least he could do would be to chance it. He went down, pausing once and glancing over his shoulder. How odd that these steps should cease to exist as soon as he passed along them. For there was now nothing but a void between himself and the front of his house. Yet he could still see the light shining up there. What would Mary think? Jim! Jim, you forgot your hat! He whirled and stared up. There was Mary on the porch, staring down into the cavity, which had been a walk. Jim! She'd seen the hole now. I'm down here, Mary. Don't come down. I'll be up in a moment. It's all right. The moonlight was too dim for him to see the expression on her face. Oh, poor thing. She was probably scared to death. Jim! Oh, my God, Jim! Was his voice reaching her? I'm all right, Mary. I'll be back as soon as I reach this door. She was starting down the steps, and he cupped his hands to shout a warning at her. She could do nothing more than step out into space. Stop, Mary, stop! There was a peal of thunder, and the earth rolled together over his head, vanishing the moonlight, throwing the whole flight into complete blackness. He stood there trembling, gripping the rough, earthy wall. From far, far off, he heard the cry, dwindling into nothing. Jim! Oh, my God, Jim! And it came again, as the news whisper. And finally, once more, as soundless as a memory. She was all right, he told himself the fury. She was all right. The hole had closed before she had got down to it. And now the trap up there was thickening and making it impossible for her voice to get through. But he felt somehow that it was all wrong, that she wasn't up there now. He began to quiver and feel sick. His head spun until he was certain that he would pitch forward and go tumbling forever into the mystery which had reached up from the bottom. The bottom. He dared not approach. Well, there was the door ahead of him. He couldn't stand here whimpering like a kid and expect to get out of this place. He'd seen the door and he'd find it. He groped down, feeling for each step with a cautious foot and discovering their spacing was not even, some of them dropping a yard and others only an inch. Below, he saw a dull gleam which seemed to emanate from a side entrance. Well, no, there was a door down there, not door. A door meant egress from these stairs. Oh, thank God he did not have to go to the bottom. Mist swirled briefly and the door was faded out, but in a moment it had appeared again, clearer than before, except that it was now closed and the light came from an indefinable source on the stairs themselves. When he stood before the door, he breathed heavily with relief 
He waited a long while before he heard any sound from within, but just as he was about to raise the knocker, there came out a grating of rusty bars which were being removed, and then the latch rattled, and the door swung wide, and the acrid smell of burning herbs and a thick, unclean cloud of darkness rolled from the place, oh, too bad sweet, as they flew forth, hitting Lowry with a soft skin wing. The smell of the place and the smoke got into his eyes so that he could not clearly see the woman. He had an impression of a wasted face and yellow teeth all broken awry of tangled, colorless hair and eyes like holes in a skull. Mother, I would like to leave these stairs, said Lowry. Mother? Oh, so you're polite tonight. James Lowry. So you'd like to flatter me into thinking that you're really going to stand there and try and come in? <laughs> oh, no, you don't, James Lowry. No, wait, mother. I don't know how you know my name, for I, I've never been here before, but... Mm, you've been on these stairs before. I never forget a face. But now you're coming down, and then you were going up, and your name was not James Lowry, and every time you went up another step, you would kick away the one below... And when you came here, you laughed at me and had me whipped and spat up on my face. <laughs> I never forget. That is not true. Well, it will do until there's something that is true in this place. <laughs> now, I suppose you were Jack. Yes. Yes, that's it, my hat. How, how did you know that I was looking? How do I know anything? <laughs> this last did that. <laughs> it went like a bat. What do you think of that? It must be that. Well, now, James Lowry, that's a very silly thing to do, to do, to do, to do, Jack. You're old enough to know better, and your head is big enough to keep a hat on. <laughs> but then that isn't all you've lost, James Lowry. Oh, no. No, it isn't. You've lost four hours, just like that, four whole hours, and you had. Do you want some advice? If you please, Mother. Can't be coming off these stairs. Oh, you feel them. You walked up them and now you'll walk down them all the way to the bottom. You must do it. That's all there is to it. You can sag and drag and gag and wag, but you've got to go to the bottom all the way down, all the way down, all the way, 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 way down. Down! Down! What's the advice? Yeah, please, Mother. Don't try it, thank you. Why not, Mother? Because if you find your hat, you find your four hours. And if you find your four hours, <laughs> then you will die. Now we blinked at her as she reached out, talon fingered toward his throat. But though he felt the bite of her nails, she was on straightening his tie. You want advice, James Lowry? Yes, Mother. Cats, and with the birds sing, there is something awry in the world. That's that's yes. And when it is spring, the world is only bracing itself for another death. Rats are rats, and hats are hats. And if you walk faster, then you'll never be a master. <laughs> you have a kind faith, James Lowry. Yes, ma'am. Down the stairs, and you'll be the man. And if you are bound to die, then ask him where you lost Jack. You'll tell me. Oh, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Bats are hats, are rats, are cats, are hats. And then there's no soup deep enough to drown. Drown what, Mother? Why to drown? That's all. For you have a tiny thing, James Lowry. Thank you, Mother. Where is the bottom, Mother? At the top, of course. Bats, beat the cats, beat the rats. Rats are hungry, James Lowry. Rats will eat you, James Lowry. Cats, you came here to bats. You go on to cats. You get eaten by the rats. You still want to find your hat? Please, Mother. Oh. 
quite contrary, stubborn, bullheaded, witless, rotten, thoughtless, bestial, wicked, heartless, contrary, stubborn, bullheaded, witless, rotten. Do you still want to fight your heart, James Lowry? Yes, Father. You don't believe in demons and devils? No, Mother. You still don't believe in demons or devils? No, Mother. Yeah. Then look behind you, James Lowry. Be warned. There was only darkness. He stood still, shivering. Did he have to go down there after all? Down to... Swiftly, he shook off the wild craving to scream. He grew calm. There was something a little different about these steps, he found. They gave out another sound, a hollow sound, as though they were built of lumber, and, unlike the others, which had been above, these were regular. After a very short descent, he almost fell, trying to reach a step which was seemingly solid earth. Yes, he was on a flat expanse of earth. He could see nothing. He had not seen the fellow before, mainly because the fellow was all dressed in black, all in black. He wore a black slouch hat with a wide brim, which almost covered the whole of his face but was unable to hide the grossness of the features or the cruelty of the mouth. His powerful but hunched shoulders were draped in a black cloak of ancient manufacture. His shoes had black buckles upon them. He was carrying a lantern which threw at best a feeble glow between himself and Lowry. This he set down and perched himself upon a wooden seat, taking something long and shaky from under his arm. He then took out a little black book and, lifting the lantern, peered intently at the pages. Flowery? That is I. Hmm. Right, fellow, aren't you? Well, everybody knows better than to shilly shabby with me. He spat loudly and looked back at the book. Hmm, nice black weather we're having, isn't it? But was that this? I suppose so. How much do you weigh, Lowry? A hundred and ninety pounds. Hmm, hundred and ninety pounds. He found a pencil and scribbled a note in his book. Then he lifted the lantern high and took a long look at Lowry's face and body. Hmm, know the form it is? I don't think so. Hmm, hundred and ninety pounds and an ordinary neck. James Lowry, isn't it? Yes. Well, we won't be knowing each other very long, but that's your trouble, not mine. What, uh, what is your name? Jack. What is Jack? Yes. Yeah, but you, you can call me Jack. He spat loudly again. If you want to do right by me, and make it easy, why just put a pound note or two in your pocket when you come up? There was a certain odour of decay about the fellow, decay and dry blood, yet which made Lowry's hair neck mount. Why the pound note? Why not? I've got to eat the same as you, useful. I can make it pretty easy, or I can make it terrible bad. Now, if you want my advice, you'll just pass over a pound note or two now. Now we can get down to business. I hate this waiting around. It's all built there, and we only get mixed up more if we keep delaying things, and you're already worried about. Now, what do you say to that? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He raised the lantern and stared at Lowry. Hmm. We look bright now. He set the lantern back and took up the long, snaky thing from his lap. His coarse fingers became busy with it. Lowry felt terror begin its slow seep through him. Jack Ketch. That was a familiar name. But he was certain that he had never seen this man before. Jack Ketch. Suddenly, Lowry saw what the man was doing. The thing he had was a rope. And on it, he was tying a hangman's noose. And those steps. There were thirteen of them. And the platform at the top. 
Kellos. No, scream Lowry, you, you can't do it. You have no reason to do it. Hey, hey Lowry, Jim Lowry, come back here, Jim Lowry. You can't run away from me. <laughs> You'll never be able to run away from me, Lowry. Jim Lowry. <laughs> the hangman's boots were thudding behind him, and the whip of the cloak was like thunder. Lowry tried to catch himself on the brink of new steps, sensing rather than seeing them. But the steps were slippery, and he could not stop. He braced himself for the shock of striking those immediately below. But he struck nothing. Tumbling, twisting, turning down, down, down through an inky void with the horror of falling, a lump of agony in his stomach, down, 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 down through mists and the slashing branches of trees and mists again. And then Lowry was lying in ooze with the feel of it squashy between his fingers and the smell of it dead and rotten. Come on, huh? You'll come around all right. A nice sleeping jail will fix you up. Never did see why men had to drink. <laughs> the words came to him dimly, and the sensation of hands touching him at last reached his consciousness. He allowed himself to be helped from the wet pavement, feeling bruised and sore. The rain was blowing under the street lamp in silver clouds which polished everything they touched. There was a damp, good smell in the night. The smell of growing and the rebirth of the soil. Old Billy Watkins, his dark poncho streaming, was standing beside him, holding him up. Old Billy Watkins, <laughs> who'd been a young constable when Lowry was a kid, and had once arrested Lowry for riding a bicycle on the sidewalk, and again on the complaint that Lowry had broken a window. And yet, old Billy Watkins could hold up Jim Lowry, that worthy professor now, and be respectful, if a little startled. The white moustache was damped into strings and was, for a change, washed quite clean with tobacco juice. I wonder, said Lowry in a thick voice, how long I've been lying there. Well, now, I, I could put it about uh, five minutes or maybe six minutes. I could come along here about that long ago and I got clear up to Chapel Street before I recollected that I'd forgot to put a call into the box down here, so I came back. And here you was, lying on the sidewalk. What time is it? Well, I guess it's pretty close to four. Sun be up pretty soon. Is your wife sick? I see some lights on in your house. No, Billy, no. I, I guess I'm the one that's sick. I started out to take a walk. Yeah, I must have been unable to sleep. Now, me, well, I find a nice hot drink of milk is about the thing to put a man to sleep. Yeah, you feel all right? Well, yes, yes, I, I feel all right now. You must have stumbled and fell. You've got a bruise on your face. You, you, you seem to have lost your hat. Yes. <laughs> yes, I guess I've lost my hat. I must have stumbled. What street is this? Why? It's your street, of course. You, yeah, that, that's your house, right? You're not 30 feet behind you. Here. I'll help you up the steps. I heard tell you, you had one of them tropical diseases. Mrs. Chalmers made the saying that it wasn't nothing bad, though, of what she wanted to go running off into those countries like that, filled with all them heathens, Jimmy. <laughs> I mean, Professor Flowery. Well, I, I guess it's exciting. I reckon it must be. Good night. Good night, Billy. With fascination, he watched old Billy Watkins go hobbling down the steps. But the walk was perfectly solid, and old Billy reached the street, turned back and waved, and then went on up the avenue through the rain. Lowry opened the door and went in. Water formed a pool about his feet as he took off his coat. Is that you, Jim? Yes, Mary. She leaned over the upper railing and, drawing her robe about her, came swiftly down. I've been half out of my mind. I was just about to call Tommy and have him come over so that we could look for you. A chill gripped him, and all concern, she threw down his coat and pulled him up the stairs. It was very cold in the old house, and colder still in his room, she got his clothes off him and rolled him in between the covers and then wiped his face and hair with a towel. There was a string of words sounding in his brain. Why, the bottom is at the top, of course. I should never let you go out. Oh, poor Mary, I've worried you. So I'm not thinking about that. You're liable to be very ill because of this. Why didn't you come back when it first began to rain? 
Mary. Yes, dear. I love you. She kissed me. You know I'd never hurt you, Mary. Of course not, Jim. I think you're good and loyal. Beautiful, Mary. Good sleep. He closed his eyes, her hand soothing upon his forehead. In a little while, he slept. He awoke to the realization that there was something horribly wrong, as if something or someone was near at hand, ready to do a thing to him. He stared around the room, but there was nothing in it. The sun was shining pleasantly upon the carpet and out of the wall, and somewhere outside, people were passing and talking, and a block or two away, an impatient hand was heavy upon a horn button. It was Sunday, and he ought to be thinking about going to church. He threw back the covers and stepped out of bed. His clothes were hung upon a chair, but the suit he had worn was smudged and spotted and muddy. He would have to be clean before he could wear it again. Mary! She must be sleeping. He pulled a robe about him and went to the door of her room. She was lying with one arm flung out across the covers. Her mouth parted a little and her hair forming a luminous cloud about her lovely face. She stirred and opened her eyes. Oh, she said awake. Ah, I've overslept. We're late for church. I'll have to get breakfast and... No, said Lowry. You aren't going to church. But Jim, you are to sleep. You just lie there and be lazy. I'm certain you haven't been in bed for more than three or four hours. Well, I'll keep up the family on you. Just turn over and sleep. My beautiful sleep. And you don't need sleep to be beautiful. He kissed her and then, closing the door behind him, went into his room and took out a dark sleep. He was feeling almost sunny himself when he walked down the porch step. But on the last one he halted, afraid to step to the walk. It took him some time. And the feeling that he was being observed by the passers-by to make him move. The walk was perfectly solid this morning, and, again with relief and near sunniness, he strolled to the street, nodding to people as he passed them. Hello, Jim. He felt a surge of elation. Hello, Tommy. You look shaky, old man, said Tommy. You'd better take better care of that malaria or the old bugs. You'll carve you hollow. <laughs> I'm all right, said Lowry, smiling. Tommy was evidently on his way to church, for he was dressed in a dark suit and a dark top coat. Tommy thought Jim was a remarkably good-looking guy. Did you take your pills on schedule? Pills? Get quinine or whatever you're supposed to take. Well, no, but I'm all right. Oh, listen, Tommy. I don't know what I've been so glad to see anybody. Tommy grinned. I'm glad to see you, Jim. We've been friends for a long time, said Lowry. Now, how long is it now? Hmm, about 34 years. Oh, well, don't say it. When one is as old as I am and still trying to act the bold Brummel, he doesn't like to have his age get around. Are you going to church? Sure. Where else would I be going? Well, Lowry shrugged and for some reason chuckled. <laughs> but we've been meeting on that corner now at about this time for a long while, said Tommy. Where's Mary? But she didn't get much sleep last night and she's staying home today. I wish I had an excuse like that. Parson Bates is a baron among boars. I don't think he'd ever heard of the Old Testament until I mentioned it to him with one of his wife's endless teas. Tommy. Tommy, look, there's something I want to ask you. Fire away, old top. Tommy, when I left you yesterday afternoon, it was about a quarter of three, wasn't it? Hmm, just about, I should imagine. And I did leave, didn't I? Oh, so please, you left, replied Tommy, rather amused. And I only had one drink. That's right. See, see, this thing is really bothering you, isn't it? Don't try to hide anything from the old seer himself. What's up? Tommy, I've lost four hours. Well, I've lost 39 years. No, I mean it, Tommy. I've lost four hours and my hat. Tommy laughed. But it's not funny, said Lowry. Jim. When you look at me with those serious eyes of yours and tell me that you're half out of your mind over a hat. <laughs> well, it's funny, that's all. No offense. I've lost four hours. I don't know what happened in them. Well, 
I suppose that would worry a fellow, but there are plenty of other hours and plenty of other hats. Oh, forget it. I can't, Tony. Ever since I lost those four hours, things have been happening to me. Oh, it's terrible things. And very swiftly, he sketched the events of the night just past. Down the stairs, said Tommy, very sober now. Yeah. I get to a point, and I get more than that. What's it all about? pleaded Larry. Tommy walked quite away in silence, and then, seeing that they were nearing the crowd before the old church, he stopped. Uh, Jim, you won't believe me. I'm ready to believe anything. Remember what I told you yesterday about your article? Do you think my article has something to do with it? Yes, I believe it has. Jim, that you took a very definite and even insulting stand upon a subject which has been dead for a hundred years at the very least. Insulting? To who? To... Well, it's hard to say, Jim, in a way that you wouldn't decry the moment it was uttered. I wouldn't try to find your hat if I were you. But somehow... Somehow I know if, if I don't find it, this thing will drive me mad. But steady now. But sometimes it's even better to be mad than dead. But listen, Jim. Those things you said you met, well, those are very definitely representative of supernatural forces. Look, I, I know you'll object. Nobody believes in supernatural forces these days. All right. But you've met some of them. Not, of course, the real ones that might search you out. You mean devils and demons? That's too specific. What do you mean? Well, first, Jensen. Then, four hours. That. By the way, Jim, have you any marks on your person that you didn't have when you were with me? Yes. Jim pulled up his coat sleeve. Hmm. That's very large. That happens to be the footprint of a hair. Look, let's forget this, said Tommy. Look, Jim. Yesterday I was feeling a little bit blue and I talked crossly about your article. Certainly it went against the grain, for I would like to believe in the actuality of such forces that they amuse me in a world where amusement is far between. And now I'm feeding these ideas of yours. Jim, believe me, if, if I can help you, I shall. But all I can do is hinder if I put ideas into your mind. What you're suffering from is some kind of malarial trick that doctors have not before noticed. It faded out of your memory for a while and you wandered around and you lost your hat. Now keep that firmly in mind. You lost your memory through malaria and you lost your hat while wandering. I'm your friend. And I'll throw everything overboard before I'll let it injure you. Now, do you understand me? Thanks, Tommy. See Dr. Charles and have him fill you full of quinine. I'll stand by and keep an eye on you so you won't wander off again. And I'll do that for another purpose as well. If you see anything, then I'll see it too. And maybe from what I know of such things, I keep any harm from befalling you. I hardly know what the don't say anything. As much as anything, I've been responsible for this with all my talk about demons and devils. I think too much of you, and I think too much of Mary to let anything happen. Yes, and Jim. Yes. Look, Jim. You don't think I fed you a drug or anything in that drink? No. I had people thought of such a thing. Oh, I wondered. You know I'm your friend, don't you, Jim? Yes, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't run the risk of telling you these things. Tommy walked on with him toward the church. The bell was tolling, the black shadow moving in the belfry, and the rolling circles of sound came down to surround the nicely dressed people on the steps and draw them gently in. Jim Lowry looked up at the friendly old structure. The leaves had not yet come out upon the ivy, so the great brown ropes went straggling across the grey stone. The stained glass windows gleamed in the sunlight. But somehow... He felt very much out of place here, always. It seemed to him that this was a sanctuary, 
and a place of rest. But now... We will sing, said a distant voice, hymn number 197. The organ began to weave so it could play, and everyone got up and dropped books and shuffled and coughed. Then the nasal voice of Parson Bates cut through the scrape and din. The choir lifted tremulous wails, and the service was on. He was on his feet again, staring blankly at the hymn book, and singing more from memory than either the notes or the organ. And then he wasn't singing, but was oblivious on everything. Some soft substance had touched against his leg. He was afraid to look down. He looked down. There was nothing there. Dry throated and trying not to shiver, he focused his gaze upon the book and picked up the hymn. He glanced at Tommy, but Tommy was crooning along in his mellow baritone, unaware of anything at the moment but the glory of God. The congregation was seated, and a plate went the round, while Bates read some announcements for the week. Lowry tried not to look at his feet, and sought not to pull them up under the bench. He was growing more and more tense, until he did not see how he could sit there longer. Something soft touched against his leg, and though he had been looking straight at the spot, there was nothing. He clutched Tommy's sleeve, and with a muttered, Come with me, got up and started up the aisle. He knew the eyes were upon him. He knew that he dared not run. He knew that Tommy was staring at him in astonishment, but was following dutifully. The sun was warm upon the street, and a few fresh leaves made sibilant music in the gentle wind. The kid in rags was sitting on the curb, tossing a dime up and down that somebody had given him for wiping out their shoes. The chauffeur drowsed over the wheel of Jepson's car, and up the street a sleepy groom held the horses of the eccentric Mrs. Lippincott, who always came in a hurry. The horses lazily swished their tails at the few flies and now and then stamped. The headstones of the cemetery looked mellow and kind above the quiet mounds of reborn grass, and an angel spread masonry wings over Silas Jones, R.I.P. There was the smell of fresh earth from the lawn which was being sodded, and the spice of willows from a nearby stream. Lowry's pace slowed under the influence of the day, for he felt better now, out in the open, where he could see for some distance on every side. Yet he decided not to tell Tommy. And Tommy asked no questions. But as they crossed the gleaming white pavement of High Street, something flickered in the corner of Lowry's eye. It was nothing very positive, just an impression of some thing, dark and round, travelling along beside him. He jerked his head to stare at it, but there was nothing there. He glanced up to see if it could have been the shadow of a bird, but aside from some sparrows foraging in the street, there were no birds. He felt the tension begin to grow in him again and again. He thought the faintest glimpse of it. But once more, he vanished under scrutiny. And yet, as soon as he turned his head front, he could sense it once more. Just the merest blob of darkness. Very small. A third time he tried to see it. And a third time, it's gone. Tommy? Yes. Uh, look, you're going to think I'm nuts. Something touched my leg in church, and there wasn't anything there. Something is coming along beside me now. I can't see it clearly, and it vanishes when I look at it. What is it? I don't see anything, said Tommy, muffling his alarm. But probably just some sun in your eye. Yes, said Lowry. Hmm. Yes, that's it. Some sun in my eye. But the mere spot of shadow, so near as he could tell, or whatever it might be, followed slowly. He increased his stride. 
and it came too. He slowed in an attempt to let the thing get ahead of him so that he could find out what it was. But it also slowed. He could feel the tension growing. You, you better not say anything about this to Mary. I won't, promise Tommy. I don't want to worry her. Last night, I know I did, but you won't worry her with any of this, will you? Of course not, said Tommy. You'd better stay over at our house tonight, if you think you'll need me. I don't know, said Lowry miserably. When they came to the walk before Lowry's house, they paused. You'll stay for dinner and for the night, won't you? As you will, smiled Tommy. They went up the stairs and into the hall, and at the sound of their entrance, Mary came out of the living room and threw her arms around Lowry's neck and kissed him. Well, so you've been to church, old heathen. Hello, Tommy. He took her extended hand. Mary, as lovely as ever. Don't let the current sweetheart hear you say that, said Mary. Staying for dinner, I hope. It chattered on while Lowry stood near the cold fireplace. My Jim, said Mary, breaking off a conversation with Tommy. You're shivering again. She put her hand on his arm and led him toward the door. Now you go right upstairs and take ten grains of quinine and then lie down for a little nap. Tommy will help me put the dinner on and keep me company, won't you, Tommy? Anything for a friend, said Tommy. It made Jim vaguely uneasy to leave them together. But then Tommy must have been here many times while he was gone in just as innocent a capacity. What was wrong with him to think that way about Tommy, about his best and really only friend? He started up the stage. And step by step, the thing jumped along with him. He pressed himself against the wall to avoid any possibility of contact with it, but the presence of the wall, barring any dodge he might make, it made him feel even more nervous. What was the thing, anyhow? Why was it tagging him? What would it do to him? What would make it go away? He shivered again. In his room, he found his quinine and taking it to his bath to get a glass of water, he was accompanied by the thing. Oh, he could see it very indistinctly against the white tile. And then he grew cunning. He guided it by slowly turning his head and then springing sideways and out the door. He banged the door behind him. <laughs> he felt better as he downed his quinine and water. For a moment, he had the inane notion that he ought to go and tell Mary not to open this door. But then, of course, it would be a much better idea to lock it. He found a key in a bedroom door and carried it to the bath. In a moment, the lock clicked home. Ah, he almost laughed aloud. And then caught himself up. That wouldn't do. Whatever the thing was, it was perfectly explainable. Yet something wrong with his eyes, that was all. It, 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 it was just malaria. Something the doctor hadn't discovered about it. He went to his bedroom, took off his jacket, and stretched out on his bed. The warm air from the open window was very soothing, and in a little while he drifted off into a quiet sleep, untroubled by dreams. A clock downstairs struck eleven in long, slow strokes. Lowry, face down upon his bed, stirred uneasily, and came up through the kindly oblivion of a doze. He woke to the realization that something horrible was about to happen to him, but lying for a while in stupor, pushing back the frontiers of his consciousness, he picked up memory after memory, inspected it, and cast it aside. No, no one of these things had any bearing on his present condition, and there was nothing that he knew about which might have caused oh, a shrill tinkle of laughter reached him. He came up quivering in every muscle, and saw the thing scurry around the bottom of his bed and get out of sight. If only he could get a full glimpse of it. There was a paper rattling somewhere, stirred by the warm night breeze, as though something in the room was sorting out his letters. And though the room seemed empty to him, after a little, a single sheet, drifting on the air, came fluttering down to the carpet by his feet. He stared at it, 
afraid to pick it up. He could see writing upon it. Finally, his curiosity overcame his fear, and he opened it and tried to read, but it was written in some ancient, incomprehensible script that blurred and ran together. The only thing legible was the time, and he could not even be sure of that. 11.30. He peered into the shadows of the room, but aside from what had dived under his bed, he was apparently alone. Had this thing come floating in with the wind? 11.30. Was this a bid for an appointment somewhere tonight? He shuddered at the thought of going forth again. But still, wasn't it possible that he might have a friend somewhere who was volunteering to help him find his four hours? And tonight he would be wary and step down no steps which he did not know had something solid at the bottom. He got up. And instantly, the little dark thing got behind him, permitting him only the slightest of glimpses. Within him, he could feel a new sensation rising, a nervous anger of the kind men feel in remembering times when they have shown cowardice. He was letting these things drag the reason out of his mind without even offering to combat them. He was being thrust about like a scarecrow in a hurricane, and the things were laughing at him, perhaps even pitying him. His fists clenched into hard hammers. God knows he had never been found lacking in courage before. Why should he cower like a sniveling cur and allow all things to steamroller him? His jaws were tight, and he felt his heart lunging inside him, and he ached to join in wild battle and put down forever the forces which were seeking to destroy him. He took a top coat from the closet and slipped into it. From a drawer, he drew a Colt thirty-eight and pocketed it. Into his other pocket, he put a flashlight. He was through being a coward about this. He would meet his ghosts and batter them down. Eleven thirty. Certainly something would lead him to the rendezvous. Perhaps something was waiting for him out in the street now. The high laughter tinkled again. And he spun around and sought, kicked the dark object. But again, it eluded him. Mind. He would deal with that later. Quietly, he slipped out of his room. Mary's light was off, and her door was closed. There was no use in disturbing her. Tommy must be in the guest room at the head of the stairs, for the door there was slightly ajar. Masking the flashlight with his fingers, so that a small segment of its light played upon the bed, he looked at Tommy. Without his cynically twisted grin, Tommy was really a very beautiful fellow, thought Lowry, and Tommy, in sleep, looked as innocent as a choir boy. Lowry crept down the stairs and out the front door to stand in the shadow of the porch and stare at the walk. It was warm tonight, and what little breeze there was whispered faintly and sweetly across the lawns. The moon was nearly full and rolled in a clear sky from which it had jealously blotted the smaller stars. Lowry went down the middle of the steps and dared the walk to open up. It did not. Almost smiling over this small triumph, he reached the street and cast about him. 11.30 was not here, but he was almost certain that if he was expected, there would be a guide. The little dark thing flicked about his legs, and the laughter sounded gently as a child's. Lowry nerved himself to listen to it, Tonight he would not cower and run away. These things had been strange to him before, but they were not strange to him now. Something would come to lead him, and he would be brave and carry out. Jim! He saw Tommy silhouetted in an upstairs window. Jim, where are you going? But there was something moving under a tree ahead, and it was beckoning to him. Jim! At least wait until I give you your hat. He felt a cold shudder race over him. The thing was beckoning more strenuously, and he sped toward it. At first he could not make out what it was. So deep was the moon shadow there. But in a moment he saw that it was a cassocked little figure, not more than four feet high, with a nearly luminous bald head. 
beads and a cross hung about his neck, and crude leather sandals exposed its toes. He received my message. Yes, where are we going? asked Lowry. You know as well as I do, don't you? No. Well, you know me, don't you? Lowry looked at him more closely. There seemed to be an intangible quality to this little monk, as if he was lacking substance. Then Lowry found that he could see through him, and behold the tree trunk and the moon-bathed curve. I am Sebastian. You turned me out of my tomb about six years ago, don't you remember? The church tombs of Chesiton. There, do you remember? Oh, but don't think I'm angry. I'm a very humble fellow. Yes, I, I'm never angry. And if I have to wander now without a home, and if my body was the dust which your digger's spades broke, oh, I'm still not angry. I'm a very humble person. And indeed, he was almost cringing. But still, there was a certain sly way he cast his eyes sideways at Jim that made one wonder. I've been lying there for three hundred years, and you, thinking it was an old Aztec ruin, because the Aztec symbols on the stone, which had been converted to its construction, dug me up. Where is my belt? Your belt? Yes, my beautiful golden belt. You picked it up and turned to your guide and said, What's this? A gold belt marked with symbols of the Catholic Church. I thought this was an Aztec ruin, a week's digging for nothing but a golden belt. It's in the college museum. Hmm. I was a little hurt about that, said Sebastian sadly. Got nothing but a golden belt. <laughs> I liked it because I made it. You see, we thought it was very beautiful. We converted Rashid to Christianity, and then we took his gold and we made sacred vessels of it. And when he died... On the mining gangs, we went even so far as to bury him with a golden cross. May I have my belt? Well, I can't get it for you now. Oh, yes, you must. Otherwise, I won't go with you and show you. But show me what? <laughs> Where you spent your four hours. You shall have your belt, but tonight... You must take me to the place where I can find the four hours. You are determined to find them, then. I am. Jim Lowry, I wonder if you know what it will cost to find them. Whatever the cost, I intend to do so. <laughs> you are brave tonight. Not brave. I know what I must do, that is all. Jim Lowry, last night... You met some things? Yes. Those things were all working on your side. They were the forces of good. You did not lose your four hours to them, Jim Lowry, nor to me. But I must find them. You could not conceive the forces of the other side. You could not conceive so much pain and terror and evil. If you are of a mind to find those four hours, you must be prepared to face those other forces. I must find them. Then, Jim Lowry, have faith in me, and I shall show you part of the way. The rest of the way, you must go alone. Lead, and I shall follow. Sebastian's delicate little hand made the sign of the cross upon the air and then moved out to point an upward way. Lowry found that he was upon a smoothly blue roadway which wound upward and onward, as though to the moon itself. Sebastian gripped his beads and began to walk. Lowry glanced around him, but for all he searched, he could not find the small black object, nor could he hear its laughter, if it was the source of that laughter. They went a long way, past spreading fields and little clusters of sleeping houses. The way began to be broken, as though it had once consisted of steps which had disintegrated to rubble, 
tufts of grass began to be more frequent in the cracks, showing that the way was little used. Ahead, a smoky outline of mountains took slow form, and then it seemed to Lowry that they had come upon them swiftly. The road began to writhe and dip on hillsides, lurching out, and then standing almost on edge toward the inside, as though earthquakes and avalanches had here been steadily at work. And, even as they passed over it, it occasionally trembled, and once, with a sigh, which ended in a roar, a whole section of it went out behind them, leaving a void. Lowry began to worry about ever being able to get back. It gets more difficult now. Sebastian headed off at right angles to the dwindling road and walked easily up a nearly vertical cliff. It is a little worse now, said Sebastian. Be very careful. Pressing against the cliff, he edged along. There were small caves here, whose dark mouths held things he could sense, but dimly he knew he must not enter them. But still, still... How else could he ever get down? One cave was larger than the rest, and though his resolution had ebbed considerably, he knew that he must go in. On hands and knees, he crept over the lip, and his hands met a furry something which made him leap back. Something struck him lightly from behind and drove him to his knees once more. The paw of this place was furry. All of it, well, was dry and ticklish to the touch. A deep, unconcerned voice said, Go along ahead of me, please. He dared not look back at the speaker, whatever it was. He got up and went along. There were great flat ledges in the place, over which he stumbled now and then. Evidently, he had lost his flashlight, but he would have been afraid to have used it. There was something awful in this place, something he could not define, but which waited in patient stillness for Jim, perhaps around the next bend, perhaps around the one after that. He came up against a rough wall which bruised him. Please go along, said the voice behind him in a bored fashion. Where, where is Sebastian, he ventured. You're not with them now. You are with us. Be as little trouble as you can, for we have a surprise waiting for you down one of these tunnels. The opening, you poor fool, is on your right. Don't you remember? But I've, I've never been here before. Oh, yes, you have. Oh, yes, indeed, you have. Hasn't he? Certainly he has, said another voice at hand. Many, many times. Oh, no, not many, said the other voice. About three times is all. That is, right here in this place. Go along, yawned the first voice. It was all he could do to force his legs to work. Something unutterably horrible was waiting for him. Something he dared not approach, something which, if he saw it, would drive him mad. You belong to us now, so go right along. He rounded a corner and blinked in a subdued light which came from a stained window high up. This place was mainly shadows and dust, but little by little he made out other things. There were seven bulls carved from stone, all along a high ledge, and each bull had one hoof poised upon a round ball as his incurious stone eyes regarded the scene below. The floor was very slippery, so that it was hard to stand, and Lowry hung hard upon a filthy drapery on his right. The room was full of people, half of the men, half of the women, with Sebastian standing at a tiny altar a little above their heads. Sebastian's Graceful hands were making slow, artistic motions over the heads, and his eyes were raised upward to meet the rays which came down from the high window. A gigantic book was open before him, and a cross and sacred ring lay upon it to hold its place, and around him, in a wide circle, filed the women. They were lovely women, all dressed in white, save for the single flash of red which came from their capes as they moved. Their faces were saintly and innocent, and their movements graceful and slow. Just outside this moving circle of women stood another circle, but of men. These were also dressed in white, but their faces were not pure. Rather, they were grinning.
and evil. Their white capes were stained with something dark, which they made no effort to hide. Sebastian prayed on and moved his hands over their head to bless them. The circle of women moved slowly and quietly around him, but did not look up at him save when they passed the front of the altar. The circle of men paid no attention whatever to Sebastian. And then Lowry was made almost to cry out, for he saw what they were doing. As the circle of women passed behind the altar, the men would suddenly reach out with clawed hands, and the women, with abruptly lascivious eyes, would glance over the shoulder at the men, and then, with reformed innocence of expression, file past the front of the altar again. The men would jostle and snigger to one another, and then the next time reach out again. Sebastian prayed on, his tender eyes upon the square of light. Lowry tried to get away, but the floor was so slippery he could hardly stand and could not run, and then he saw what made the floor so slippery. It was an inch thick in blood. He screamed. Everyone whirled to stare at him. Sebastian stopped praying and bent a kindly smile upon him. All the rest muttered among themselves and pointed and scowled, an undertone of anger growing from them. The seven bulls upon the ledge came to life with a bellow. They moved their hoofs and the balls rolled. And it could be seen then that they had human skulls there. Again they moved their hoofs, and the skulls came tumbling down from the ledge to strike in the midst of the angry mob, felling some of the women and men, but not touching Sebastian. Lowry could not run. He could not breathe. The mob was howling with rage now, and evidently thinking he had thrown the skulls, surged forward toward him. Just before they reached him, he was able to make the incline, as swiftly as he could, he raced up it. A sinuous shape shot out and barred his way. He crashed into a wall, and then, when he rose up and strove to find a way out, there was none. The roar of the mob was growing louder. He tore his hands as he tried to find the exit. He pitched forward and fell from a height. There was grass in his fingers and moonlight above him, and he leaped up and raced away, running through sand which reduced his speed and made him stumble. He could still hear whirring sounds above and behind him. He was out distancing the mob, but could he never get free from those shapes? Sebastian! But there was no Sebastian. Sebastian! And just the whir of things overhead and the blurred glimpses of things that raced with him. The moon was white upon a wide expanse, not unlike a dried-up lake of salt. And he was out in the open now and there was neither hiding place nor refuge. He was out in the open and being hunted by things he could not see, things which wanted to take him back. A shadowy shape loomed ahead, still afar. He forced himself to slow down and turn off away from it. There was something about his head, something about the dark cloak, something about the thing which dangled from its hand. <gasps> Chetch! There was a ravine and he scrambled down it. He crept along its bottom and went deep into a shadowy grove which he had found there. Something was calling to him now, but he could not tell what the words were. Something calling which must never, never find him here. There were white mountains around him and high above him, and they offered refuge to him, and he went deeper into them. The trees were thicker, and the grass was soft and protected. Something was beating through the bushes in an attempt to locate him, and he lay very still, pressing hard against the earth. The something came nearer and nearer, and the voice was muttering. And then the voice receded, and the cracking sounds grew fainter, and Lowry stretched out at length in the dewy grass, getting his breath. The moonlight made delicate shadow patterns about this place, and the night wind was warm, and caressing, oh, and he began to breathe quietly, oh, and the hammering of his heart lessened. It was an almost triumphant feeling that went through him then. He had not found his four hours, he had not found them. He raised himself a trifle and cupped his chin in his hand, staring unseeingly at the white thing just before him. He had not found his four hours, and then 
his eyes focused upon the thing before which he lay. He was conscious that he was lying half across a mound and that there was the fresh smell of flowers too late growing for spring. There was writing upon that white stone. But what kind of writing? He inched a little closer and read, James Lowry, born 1901, died 1940. Rest in peace. He recoiled. He got to his knees and then to his feet. The whole night was spinning, and the high, shrill laughter was sounding again, and the little dark shape dashed around to get out of his sight. With a piercing cry, he spun about and raced madly away. He had found peace for a moment, peace and rest, before the headstone of his own future grave. When he awoke the following morning, he knew by the position of the sun on the wall that he still had at least half an hour before he had to rise. Usually, when that was the case, he could lie and stretch and inch down in the covers and relish his laziness. A robin was sitting in a tree outside his window, cocking his head first to one side, then to the other, as it sought to spy worms from that ambitious altitude. Now and then the bird would forget about worms and loose a few notes of joyous exuberance. Downstairs, Lowry could hear Mary singing in an absent-minded way, going no more than half a chorus to a song he could not quite recognize, but there was something different about this morning. On the second floor hall, just outside his door, he heard a board creak. Somehow, there was menace in the sound. The knob of the door turned soundlessly, and a minute crack appeared, another board creaked, and a hinge protested in a hushed tone. Lowry half closed his eyes, pretending to be asleep. Tommy's face, crowned by disheveled dark hair, was just beyond the opening. Lowry lay still. Tommy crossed the threshold with soundless tread and moved to the foot of the bed. For a little while, Tommy stood there, looking out from an immobile face. Lowry's eyes were very nearly shut, enough to deceive an observer. Why, Lowry asked himself, did he lie here faking like this? It was Lowry's impulse to reach up and snatch at Tommy's white shirt, but some latent protective sense combined with his curiosity to let matters take their course. Tommy's hand moved gracefully across Lowry's eyes once, and then twice. A numb sensation began to creep over Lowry. Now was the time to move. That he would awake and greet Tommy. But he couldn't move. He seemed to be frozen. And Tommy leaned over until their faces were not three inches apart. For an instant, Lowry thought he saw fangs in Tommy's mouth. But before he could gain a whole impression, the teeth had again foreshortened. Tommy stayed there for more than a minute, and then straightened up, a cold smile taking the beauty from his face. He passed his hand across Lowry's forehead and, with a quiet nod, turned and stole out into the hall. The door clicked, slowly shut, behind him. It was some time before Lowry could move, and when he did, he was weak. He sat on the edge of the bed, feeling shaky, as a man might who'd just given a blood transfusion. When he'd assembled enough energy, he approached the mirror and, gripping the bureau top with both hands, stared at himself. His eyes were so far sunken in his head beneath his shaggy brows that he could barely make out his own pupils. His hair was matted. His face seemed to have lost a certain pugnacity with which he'd always attempted to compensate for his shyness. Obviously... He had lost a great deal of weight, for his cheeks were sunken, and a pallor as grey as the belly of a rain cloud gave him a shock, so much did it cause him to resemble a dead man. He forgot the cost of his exertions and swiftly tried to wipe out the ravages of nerve strain by carefully shaving and bathing and grooming, and when he again looked into the mirror, 
tying his cravat, he was a little hardened. After all, here it was, a fresh spring day. Devil take Jepson, the old fool will be dead long before James Lowry. Devil take the four hours. Devil take the phantoms which had assailed him. He had courage enough and strength enough to last them out. He had too much courage and willpower to cause him to back down on his original assertions in the article. Let them do their worst. Half an hour later, he entered his classroom. Oh, it was good to be in such a familiar place. Good to stand up here on the platform and watch the students pass the door in the hall. Presently, they would come in here and he would begin to drone along on the subject of ancient beliefs in ancient civilizations. And perhaps, after all, everything was right with the world. He glanced around to see if everything was in its place, if the board was clean for his notes. He stared at the board behind the platform. That was strange. These were always washed over the weekend. What was that sentence doing there? You are the entity. Wait for us in your office. What curious script it was. Not unlike that note he'd gotten in some way. But this he could very clearly read. Entity. You are the entity. What could that be about? Wait in his office for whom? For what? A sick feeling of impending disaster began to take hold of him. What trick was this? He snatched up an eraser and furiously rubbed back and forth across the message. At first it would not erase, and then, slowly, when he wiped across the first word, it vanished. Then the second, the third, the fourth. It was erasing now. He finished it so thoroughly that not the slightest mark of it was left. And then, first word, second word. Letter by letter, with slow cadence, appeared once more. He began to quiver. Again, he grabbed the eraser and rubbed the message out. Slowly, letter by letter, it appeared again. You are the entity. Wait for us in your office. He flung the eraser away from him just as the first students entered. He wondered what they would think about the message. Yeah, perhaps... He could trump up some excuse, in include it in the lesson. No. Pupils were used to weird statements on blackboards, holdovers from past classes, yet he had better ignore it completely. The class shuffled and moved seats and greeted one another the width and length of the room. A girl had a new dress and was being casual. A boy had a new sweetheart and was trying to act very manly in her sight and very careless before his own friends. The rattling and talking and scraping gradually died down. A bell rang. Lowry began his lecture. Only long habits and much reading from the book carried him through. Now and then during the hour, his own words came into his consciousness for a moment and he seemed to be talking rationally enough. The students were making notes and dozing and whispering and chewing gum. It was a normal enough class and obviously they saw nothing wrong. Lowry said, this fallacious belief and the natural reluctance of the human being to enter in upon and explore anything so intimately connected with the gods as sickness served as an effective barrier for centuries to any ingress into the realm of medical science. In China, waiting in his office, what could be waiting? And what did it mean? Entity. Even when medicinal means were discovered by which fever could be induced or pain lessened, the common people ascribed the fact to the dislike of the demon of illness or that particular herb or the magic qualities of the ritual. Even the doctors themselves long continued certain ritualistic practices, first because they themselves were not sure and because the state of mind of the patient being a large factor in his possible cure could be bettered by the apparent flattery of the patient's own beliefs. Yeah, it was a relief to be able to stand here and talk to them as though nothing were wrong. And it was a normal class for they kept gazing through the windows and out of doors where the sun was bright and friendly and the grass cool and soft. In any culture, medical cure begins its history with the thunder of a witch doctor's drums, by which the witch doctor attempts to exercise his patient. Here, he always essayed a small joke about a patient letting himself be cured in a wild effort to save his own eardrums. But just now, 
he could not utter it. Why? he asked himself. Man's predisposition to illness at first acted as a confirmation of spirits and demons, for there was no visible difference in many cases between a well patient and a sick one, and what man has not been able to see he attributes to devils and demons. Strange, wasn't it, that medicine drums did cure people? Strange that incantations and health amulets had been man's sole protection from bacteria for generations without count? Strange that medicine itself still retained a multitude of forms which were directly traceable to demons and devils. And that pile of crutches in that Mexican church indicated the efficacy of faith in even hopeless cases. The church. And now that people had turned from the church to a wholly materialistic culture, was it not odd that worldly affairs were so bloody and grim? Demons of hate and devils of destruction, whose lot was to jeer at man and increase his misfortunes? Spirits of the land and water and air abandoned in belief and left unhampered to work their evil upon a world? He stopped. The class was no longer whispering and chewing gum and staring out the window or dozing. Wide young eyes were fixed upon him in fascination. He realized that he had spoken his last thoughts aloud. For a moment, no longer than an expressive pause would be, he studied his class. Young minds, ready and waiting to be fed anything that any man of repute might wish to feed them. Sponges for the half-truths and outright lies and propaganda called education. Material to be molded into any shape that their superiors might select. How did he know if he had ever taught truth? He did not even know if the dissemination of democracy itself was error or right. These were the children of the next generation, on the sill of marriage and the legal war of business. Could he, with his background, ever tell them anything which might help them? He who had been so sure for so many years that all was explainable via material science, he who now had wandered far and had seen things and talked to beings he had for years decried, could he say now what he had said so often before? He spoke out loud again. And because of that very belief so deeply rooted in our ancestors, none of us today is sure, but there was some truth in those ancient thoughts, or perhaps, why should he back off now? These were his for the moulding. Why should he stand here and lie when not twelve hours ago he had walked with phantoms, had been guided by a priest three hundred and more years dead, had been whipped on by things he had not seen, who even now could catch a glimpse of a black object which threw a shadow where there was no sun. These were his for the moldy. Why should he be afraid of them? Men of science, he began again in a quiet voice, have sought to clear fear from the minds of men by telling men that there is nothing of which he must be afraid just because he cannot see the actual cause. Men today have spread the feeling that all things are explained and that even God himself has had his face gazed upon through the medium of an electric arc. But now, standing here, I am not sure of anything. I have dipped back to find that countless billions of people, all those who have lived prior to the late century, regulated their lives with due respect to a supernatural world. Man has always known that his lot upon this earth is misery, and he has, until a split second ago in geological time, understood that there must be beings who take delight in torturing him. In this class, at this very moment, there are at least half a dozen amulets in which the owner places considerable faith. You call them luck charms, and you receive them from one beloved, or found them through an incident beyond your power or comprehension. You have a semi-belief, then, in a goddess of luck, you have a semi-belief in a god of disaster. You have all noticed from time to time that at that moment when you felt the most certain of your own invulnerability, 
that that moment was the beginning of your own downfall. To say aloud that you are never ill seems to invite illness. How many lads have you known who have bragged to you that they have never had accidents, only later to visit them after an accident? And if you did not say some belief in this, then you would not nervously look for wood each time you make a brag about your own fortune. This is a modern world full of material explanations, and yet there is no machine which will guarantee luck. There is no clear statement of any law which serves to regulate man's fate. We know that we face a certain amount of light, and disclaiming any credence in the supernatural or any existing set of malicious gods, we still understand and clearly that our backs are against the darkness and the void, and that we have a very slight understanding of the amount of misery we are made to experience. We talk about breaks, and we carry luck charms, and we knock on wood. We put crosses on top of our churches and arches in our belfries. When one accident has happened, we wait for the other two and only feel at ease when the other two have happened. We place our faiths in a God of good, and by that faith carry through, or we go without help through the dim burrows of life, watchful for a demoniac agent of destruction which may rob us of our happiness, or we arrogantly place all faith in ourselves and dare the fates to do their worst. We shiver in the dark. We shudder in the presence of the dead. We look. Uh, some of us, to mystic sciences like astrology or numerology to reassure us that our way is clear. And no person in this room, if placed at midnight in a haunted house, would deny there the non-existence of ghosts. We are intelligent beings, giving our lips to disbelief, but rolling our eyes behind us to search out any danger which might swoop down from that black void. Why? Is it true, then, that there exist about us demons and devils and spirits whose jealousy of man leads on to the manufacture of willful harm? Or, despite the evidence of the science of probabilities against the explanation of coincidence, are we to state that mankind brings its misery upon itself? Are there agencies which we generally lack power to perceive? As a question only, let me ask, might it not be possible that all of us possess a latent sense which, in our modern scurry, has lapsed in its development? Might not our own ancestors, acute to the primitive dangers, exposed to the wind of the dark, have given attention to the individual development of that sense? And because we have neglected to individually heighten our own perceptions, are we now blind to extra material agencies? And might we not, at any moment, experience a sudden rebirth of that sense and, as vividly as in a lightning flash, see those things which jealously menace our existences? If we could but see, for ever so brief a period, the supernatural, would we then begin to understand the complexities which beset man? But if we experience that rebirth, and then told of what we saw, might we not be dubbed mad if what of the visions of the saints? As children, all of us felt the phantoms of the dark. Might not th that sense be less latent in a child whose mind is not yet dulled by the excess burden of facts and facts and more facts? Are there not men in this world today who have converse with the supernatural, but who cannot demonstrate or explain or be believed because of the lack in others of that peculiar sense? I'm giving you something on which to ponder. You've listened patiently to me for long weeks, and you've filled notebooks with scraps of ethnology. I have not once, in all that time until now, caused you to think one thought, or ponder one question. Yet there is the bell. Yet think over what I have said. Half of them, as they wandered out, seemed to think it was one of Professor Lowry's well-known jokes. The other half, of more acute perception, seemed to wonder 
if Professor Lowry was ill. Somehow it made no difference to Lowry what they wondered. He seated himself in his chair and was avoiding all looks by sorting out notes. You are the entity. Wait for us in your office. For some time, Lowry sat in his office, staring at the disarranged stacks of paper which cluttered his desk, wondering at the way he had finished his lecture. It seemed to him, as he thought about it, that man's lot seems to be a recanting of statement and prejudice. Those things which he most wildly vows he will not do are those things which eventually he must do. Those beliefs which are the most foreign to his nature are eventually thrust down his throat by a, a malignant fate. To think that he, James Lowry, ethnologist, would ever come near a recognition of extrasensory forces, well, here he was, waiting. It, waiting for what? Those four hours? The thought made him rise and pace around the room, with the hunched manner of a jungle brute surrounded by bars, he caught himself at it and forced calmness by stirring various bundles with his foot and looking at the address labels of the things which had been shipped up from Yucatan. There was a year's work at this classification, and even he did not know what he had here. Bits of stone, pieces of rubble, plaster casts of prints, hasty miniatures of idols, a scroll in a metal container. To fill his waiting, he unwrapped the first box at hand, and set it on the desk, he lifted the cover from it. It was just a fossilized skull found beside a sacrificial block, the last relic of some poor devil that had his heart torn, living from his body to satisfy the priest-imagined craving of some brutal deity whose life was thought to need renewal. Just a brown, sightless skull, he had dug this out quite cold-bloodedly, so used had he become to his job. Why did it make him shudder so now? His name. That was it. That must be it. His name engraved upon that headstone. James Lowry. Born 1901. Died 1940. Rest in peace. Odd that he should somehow fall upon the grassy mound of his own grave. Odder still that it would be the one place he had found rest that night. And the date... 1940. He swallowed a dry lump which threatened to cut off his breathing. This year, tomorrow, next week, next month, died 1940. And he had found rest from his torment. The door opened and Tommy came in. Lowry knew who it was, but he could not quite bring himself to look at Tommy's face, and when he did, as his eyes swept up, he saw a malevolent smile. So, life is too dull for you, said Tommy with a smile. You wouldn't want to send up to chemistry for some nitroglycerin, would you? Or do you need it? What's wrong? Nothing wrong, except that one of your students nearly collapsed from hysteria, and the rest of them, or some of them at least, are walking around muttering to themselves about demons and devils. Don't tell me that you're seeing things my way now. Not your way, said Lowry. What a man sees, he's forced to believe. Well, 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 old witch Dr. Lowry himself. Do you actually think those things they say you said? What else can I think? For 48 hours I've walked and talked, pursued and been pursued by phantoms. You seem quite calm about it. Why shouldn't I be calm? Oh, no reason. You seem much less agitated than you've been the past few days, or Saturday or Sunday, to be exact. Is, well, do you see? It's there, said Lowry. A man can get used to anything. The door opened a second time, and they turned to see Mary. She was oblivious of any stir Lowry might have made in class, and had no anxiety to question him, evidently feeling that she might possibly be the cause of some of his strange actions. She looked, half frightened now, for all that she was smiling, and then, seeing Lowry smile at her, she brightened. Hello, Jim. 
Hello, Tommy. I just breezed by for a very wifely reason, Jim. The Exchequer, uh, much as I hate to mention it, is at a very low ebb, and spring and an empty larder demand some clothes and some groceries. Jim pulled out his checkbook. That, said Tommy, is the reason I'll never marry. It's a pleasure, said Lowry, writing out a check. It's two hours to my next class, said Tommy. May I be burdened down with your bundles? Oh, such a delightful beast of burden is quite acceptable, said Mary with a curtsy. Lowry gave her the check, and she kissed him lightly. Tommy took her arm, and they left the office. Was it some sort of sensory illusion that caused Lowry to momentarily feel fangs in her mouth? Was it some way the light fell upon her face that made him see those fangs? Was it a natural jealousy which made him believe she looked lovingly at Tommy as they went out of the door? He shook his head violently in an effort to clear away such horrible thoughts and turned to his desk to find himself face to face with the skull. Angrily, he put the top upon the box and cast it away from him, but the top did not stay on, nor did the box remain atop the pile of packages. The skull rolled with a hollow sound and finally stood on its nose hole against his foot. He kicked it, and it thumped slowly into the corner where its sightless sockets regarded him in mild reproach. One of its teeth had fallen out and made a brown dot on the carpet. James Lowry, born 1901, died 1940, rest in peace. His thoughts had gotten all tangled up until he could not remember if this was Sebastian's skull or not, or even if Sebastian's grave had yielded anything but dust and the golden belt. Aimlessly, from the depths of his high school cramming came the words, To be or not to be, that is the question. He said them over several times before he recognized them at all. He essayed then a sort of grim joke muttering. Alas, poor Lowry. I knew him, Horatio. He tried to laugh at himself and failed. He could feel his nerves tautening again. He could hear the echoes of the old mother's remarks. Cats, hats, rats. Cats, hats, rats. Cats, bats, cats, rats. Hats lead to bats, lead to cats, lead to rats. Rats are hungry, James Lowry. Rats will eat you, James Lowry. Hats, you came here to batch. You go on to catch. You get eaten by rats. Do you still want to find your hat? Hats, bats, cats, rats. Rats are hungry, James Lowry. Rats will eat you, 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 James Lowry. Do you still want to find your hat? Do you still want to find your hat? Do you still want to find your hat? He threw himself away from the desk and crashed his chair to the floor. The sound of violence gave him some relief, but the second he picked it up, hats, bats, rats, cats, hats, bats, cats, rats, hats, 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 bats, 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 rats, 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 hats, bats, cats, rats, hats, rats, hats, bats, cats, cats, rats, rats, bats, cats. Do you still want to find your hat, James Lowry? No! Then, said a childish treble, you are the entity. He glanced around his office in search of the owner of the voice. But the office was empty. And then, Clowry saw a certain movement on the wall before his desk where a bookcase had been taken away, leaving a meaningless pattern of scars upon the plaster. He stared at the place intently, and found that it was taking a definite shape. First, the vague outline of a face, and then, little by little, an extension, which began to form as a body. Hair came into being upon the head, and the eyes moved slightly, and a hand emerged from the wall to be followed by the rest. I would dislike frightening you, said the high musical voice. The thing looked like a child, not more than four years old, a little girl with long blonde curls and shapely dimpled limbs. She was dressed in a frilled frock, all clean and white, 
and a white bow was slightly to one side of her head. Her face was round and beautiful, but it was a strange kind of beauty, not altogether childish. The eyes were such a dark blue, they were almost black, and deep in them was an expression which was not an innocent child's, but more a lascivious wanton's. The lips were full and rich and slightly parted, as though to bestow a greedy lover's kiss, and, like an aura, a black shadow stood in globular shape around her. But at a casual, swift glance, it was a little child, no more than four, naive and full of laughter. The lewd eyes lingered caressingly upon Lowry's face as she perched herself upon the top of his desk. No, I do not frighten you, do I? What, what are you? said Lowry. Why, a child, of course. Have you no eyes? And pensively then, You know, you're a very handsome-looking man, Mr. Lowry. <laughs> so, so big, rough. A dreamy look came into her eyes, and her small pink tongue flicked out to dampen her lips convulsively. You wrote that message? No, but I come to tell you about it. You are quite sure now, Mr. Lowry, that you do not want to find your hat? No. Oh, it was a very pretty hat. I never want to see it again. She smiled and leaned back languorously, her little shoes making occasional thumps against the side of the desk. She yawned and stretched and then looked long at him. The full little lips quivered and the pink tongue flicked. With a seeming effort, she brought herself to business. If you are through with all such nonsense and disbelief in us, she began, and if you will aid us against the others, then I shall tell you something you should be glad to hear. Are you? Blowery hesitated and then nodded. He felt very weary. You visited your friend, Tommy Williams, just before you lost your four hours, didn't you? You probably know more about it than I, said Lowry with bitterness. <laughs> For a moment she laughed, and Lowry started up as he recognized the sound which had been near him so many hours. He looked studiously at her and found that her image seemed to pulsate, and that the black aura expanded and contracted, like some great unclean thing breathing. She swung her little princess slippers against the desk and continued, Tommy Williams told you the truth. You offered us a challenge and said we did not exist, and we know more about you than you do. You see, all this was scheduled anyway. Every few generations, Mr. Lowry, we even up accounts with mankind. Such period has just begun, and you, Mr. Lowry, are invested with control. For we must have a human control. She smiled, and the dimples appeared in her soft cheeks. She smoothed out her dress with little girl gestures, and then, looking at him, she drummed her heels. That is what we mean by entity, Mr. Lowry. You are the entity, the center of control. Usually, all life, at fleeting instants, takes turns in passing this along. Now, perhaps you have, at one time in your life, had a sudden feeling, I am I. Well, that awareness of yourself is akin to what men call godliness. For an instant, nearly every living thing in this world has been the one entity, the focal point for all life. It is like a torch being passed from hand to hand. Usually, innocent little children, <laughs> such as myself, are invested. And so it is that a child ponders much upon his own identity. What are you trying to tell me? 
Why? She said demurely. I'm telling you that this is the period when we choose an entity and invest that function in just one man. Your Tommy Williams, I believe, knows about it. So, long as you live, then the world is animated. So long as you walk and hear and see, the world goes forward. In your immediate vicinity, you understand all life is concentrating upon demonstrating that it is alive. It is not. Others are only props for you. This would have happened to you a long time ago, but it was difficult to achieve communication with you. You are the entity, the only living thing in this world. The globe of darkness around her pulsated gently. She touched her dainty hands to her white hair ribbon and then folded them in her lap. She looked fixedly at Lowry, and that slow look of the wanton came into her eyes, and her lips parted a little, her breath quickened. What, uh, what am I expected to do? said Lowry. Say nothing. You are the entity. He is the entity, growled a chorus of voices in other parts of the room. But why do you tell me? So that nothing will worry you, and so that you will do nothing rash. You are afraid of Tommy Williams. Well, Tommy Williams, as well as Jepson and Billy Watkins, is just a prop with which you motivate yourself. Then how is it that this morning he came to me and leaned over and stared at my face and I could not move? She tensed. What is this he did? Just stared into my face. And I keep seeing fangs when I don't look at him directly. Oh, she cried in shocked pain. Then it is impossible. There's nothing you can do. Tommy Williams is the leader of the others. You must somehow settle accounts with Tommy Williams. Why? He's already taken from you a part of your soul substance. He was here just a few minutes ago. Every time he sees you, he'll try to take some. You must prevent it. How? The little child was gone, and the black aura turned darker and began to vanish at the top until it seemed like a small, round, black thing. With a smoke puff, it was gone. How? shouted Lowry. Only the echo of his own voice against his own walls answered him, and when he fixed his eyes upon the broken spot in the plaster, it was just a broken spot, with no resemblance whatever to either a face or anything else. What had that thing been? Where was it now? Oh! Lowry buried his face in his arms. When the twelve o'clock bell rang, Lowry got up more from force of habit than from any wish to leave his office. A gnawing ache of apprehension was suffused through his being, as though he subconsciously expected a blow to smash him at any moment from the least expected quarter. With effort, he put the feeling down. He squared his shoulders and slipped into his top coat and strode forth with watchful eyes. But there was another feeling which was gradually coming toward recognition in him, a feeling that nothing could touch him. And as the first one was stamped out, the second one rose. It was not unlike a religious fanatic's trust in a personally interested God, a thing which seemed very foreign to Lowry. And as he walked through the hurrying crowds of students in the halls and down the stairs, he began to be conscious of his own size and strength. Outside, a student had taken a seat upon the steps so that the penetrating languor of sunlight could caress his back. In his hands, he held a newspaper. As Lowry passed him, he wondered for a moment what was going on in the world and so he glanced at the sheet. For an instant, he wondered if he were going blind. There wasn't any printing on the paper. It was just a white sheet. But for all that, 
The students seemed to be reading it with avidity. Lowry, troubled a little, went on, but as he walked, the exhilaration of exercise restored the pleasant feeling within him, and he gradually forgot about the newspaper. Several small groups of students were standing along the walk, chattering among themselves. A man was pushing a lawnmower industriously. A boy was trotting along with the yellow telegraph envelope in his hand. Suddenly, Lowry had a strange feeling about things, as though something was happening behind him, which he should know about. He stopped and whirled around. The boy had stopped trotting, but started instantly. The man at the lawnmower had paused, but now was mowing again. The little crowds of students had ceased gesticulating and laughing for the smallest fraction of time, but instantly went to it once more. Lowry pondered the matter as he walked on. Yet perhaps there was something happening in his head, like false memory. Certainly, it was just his imagination which led him to believe that things had paused outside his observation. Old Billy Watkins, up earlier than usual, came limping by. He paused and touched his cap. You feeling better today, Jim? Oh, uh, uh, Professor Lowry? Uh, yeah, much better, thanks. Well, take care of yourself, Jim. Uh, uh, Professor Lowry? Uh, thanks, Billy. Lowry walked on, and then again he had that feeling. He stopped, looked over his shoulder. Old Bill Watkins was standing like a limp scarecrow, but as soon as Jim Lowry really noticed it, old Billy went on swinging down the street. And the man of the lawnmower and the messenger and the students, they had all stopped too, only to resume under Lowry's glance. That was very strange, thought Lowry. The suspicion took form in him, and he suddenly changed his course. What about all these houses? What about them? When he got halfway down the block that he had never traversed in his memory, he stepped abruptly into an alleyway, just as he had expected. These houses had fronts, but no backs. They were sets. He went on down the alley, and here and there, people made belated attempts to complete the false fronts and give them false backs, but they were fumbling and bewildered, as though Lowry's presence and appearance set their knees to knocking. What of the main street? He'd never been in many of the stores. Feeling he had to put this thing to complete test, he hurried along, unmindful of the effect he seemed to have upon these puppets. He rounded a block of the main thoroughfare of the town, but just before he turned the corner, a terror-stricken voice reached him. Jim! 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 Oh, my God, Jim! He leapt around the corner and halted appalled. The whole avenue was littered with apparently dead people. They were sprawled against steering wheels and in the gutter. They were leaning stiffly against door fronts. The traffic cop was a rag draped about his signal. A two-horse team was down in the traces, and the farmer on the box was canted over, slack-jawed as a corpse. And through this tangled carpet of props ran Mary. Her hat was gone, and her hair was wild, and her eyes were dilated with horror. He called to her, and she almost fell with relief, sobbing, arms outstretched. She threw herself upon him and buried a tear-streaked face upon his breast. Jim, she sobbed. Oh, my God, Jim. As he smoothed down her hair with a gentle hand, he watched the street come to life and resume the petty activity with which he was so familiar. The cop blew his whistle. The farmer took a chew and spat. Buyers and sellers bought and sold. And there was not one thing wrong with the whole street. But Jim knew that if he looked behind him, those people who now passed him would be stopped again, slumped, their puppet strings slack. A familiar figure swung along toward them, Tommy, swinging a limber black stick, his hat on the back of his head, and his handsome face, with his customary quirk of amusement, approached them and paused in recognition. Hello, Jim. And then in concern, is something wrong with Mary? You know what's wrong with Mary, Tom Williams. Tommy looked at him oddly. No, I, I don't get you, old man. Yet yeah, not that you wouldn't try, said Jim with a cold grin at his own humor. I've had enough of this. Enough of what? You took something from me. I want it back. I know about this, you see. Well, I want that part of myself back. You accuse me of being a thief. 
Well, so long as I had all of myself, all was well in this world. Now that part of me is gone. Tommy laughed amusedly. Oh, so you've caught on, have you? <laughs> well, I'll remedy this, Tom Williams, or I'll put an end to you. Tommy's laugh was brittle, and he swung the cane as though he would like to strike out with it. How is it that you rate so much? I don't know. Or care how it is. What is mine is mine. Give me back that part of myself, Tom Williams. And lose my own, said Tommy with a smile. What's mine is mine, said Lowry. I believe in a more communistic attitude, said Tommy. I happen to want that part of you, and I certainly intend to keep it. And now, Lowry noticed, fangs appeared at the corner of his mouth. Lowry put Mary to one side. He snatched out and grabbed Tommy's coat and hauled him close, aiming a blow. Somehow, Tommy twisted from the grasp and, in his turn, struck hard with his cane. For an instant, the world for Lowry was ink. But he came up in an effort to lunge at Tommy's throat. Again, the cane felled him. Stunned now, he swayed on his hands and knees, trying to clear his fog senses. Once more, the cane struck him, and he felt the pavement strike against his cheek. In a little while, he was conscious of a face close to his own, a face from which protruded yellow fangs. A sick weakness, as though he was bleeding to death, pinned him to the walk. Tommy stood up straight, and Lowry found that he could not move. Tommy seemed twice as big and strong as before. Mary looked at Tommy for a long while, the expression of her face slowly changing from one of wonder to one of agreeable satisfaction. And then, Lowry knew why it was. She was nothing but a puppet herself, animated more than any of the rest, because she had been more with a source. And when Tommy had taken a part of him, she had begun to divide her attention between them, for either one could animate her. And now that Tommy possessed an allness, there could be no question as to which one she would follow. She gave no glance at all to Lowry on the walk. She looked up into Tommy's face and smiled tenderly. Tommy smiled back, and arm in arm, they walked away. Lowry tried to shout after them, but they paid no heed. They were gone around the corner. By degrees, then, the street began to slump and become still. By degrees, but not wholly. Here and there, a puppet twitched a little. Here and there, a mouth made motions without making sound. <sighs> Lowry stared in terror at the scene. For him, the world was nearly dead. His body was so heavy that he could scarcely move at all. But he knew that he must pursue them, find them, gain back that vital force which had been stolen. It was nearly dusk when he awoke. He stretched himself stiffly, for he had become cold. For a moment, he could not recall the events which had passed, and he came to his knees, aware of a thing he must do, but not quite able to place it. Oh, this lethargy. Was it affecting his brain as well? But no, his brain was all right, yes. Tommy and Mary and the world of the apparent dead. <laughs> yeah, but what a tremendous amount of good that rest had done him, or else... He peered forth from the bushes. There were people walking along the street, and so it was fairly plain that Tommy would be somewhere nearby and that Lowry himself was drawing some of the force in common with the other puppets. Perhaps that would help him. If he could get close to Tommy, and then, supported by Tommy's own effect, he could possibly win back what he had lost. He emerged from a cover. There was a man standing beside the letterbox in the corner. Maybe he would know where to find Tommy. Lowry, assuming a careless air, sauntered up to the fellow. He was about to open his mouth and begin to question when his heart lurched within. This was Tommy. Tommy, with a mocking smile upon his mouth and a sly look in his eye. Lowry whirled and sped away, but when he found that no footsteps followed, he slowed down. He glanced back, and the man on the corner was looking after him, and there was a light, cheerful laughter suspended in the air. Why wasn't he able to face him? 
Did he have to find him sleeping in order to steal away that which he had lost? Lowry stopped. Oh, couldn't he be more clever about this? Couldn't he perhaps explain to some of these puppets what had happened to the world and thereby gain help? Many of them could assail Tommy and weigh him down and take that from him which rightfully belonged to the world. He went along, looking for someone to whom he could broach the plan. A man was watering a lawn inside a picket fence, and Lowry stopped and beckoned to him. The man, holding the hose, strolled languidly over. It was Tommy. Lowry whirled and ran. And again the light laughter hung upon the evening air. He slowed down stubbornly, refusing to be panicked. There was no use losing his head, for he still had a chance. Not everyone could be Tommy. Soon he saw a woman hurrying homeward. If he told her, and she told her husband, yes, he would stop her. He held up his hand, and she dodged from him, but seeing no menace in him, she allowed him to speak. He had uttered just one word when he saw who she was. Mary! His heart skipped a beat. Here she was alone, and he could plead with her. Again, he started to speak. But Mary's face was full of scorn, and she turned her back upon him and walked away. It took Lowry some seconds to get over that, but he would not admit defeat. Here came three students. Students would obey him, certainly, and these fellows wore sweaters with stripes around the arm. He stepped out in front of them. When they stopped and were looking at him, he started to speak, and then he stopped. Each face into which he looked, in turn, became Tommy's. Each face possessed that mocking smile and that slyly evil glint of eye. Lowry stepped back and kept on walking backwards. He spun around or ran away and did not stop until he had come to the corner of the next block. A woman was there, but <laughs> he knew better than to halt her, for even at ten feet, by the light of the street lamp, he could see that she was Mary. He pulled his hat ashamedly down over his eyes and slouched by, and then, when she was going away from him, he began to run once more. He fled past other pedestrians, and each one that looked at him was possessed of the face of either Tommy or Mary, and after a little they began to call to him at intervals. Hello, Jim, said Tommy in a mockery each time. Oh, it's you, Jim, said Mary. Thickening dark and the thin street lamps glowing oppressed Lowry. It was becoming warmer by degrees and then, swiftly, turned cold. The house fronts were chill and impassive in the gloom. Their lighted windows like glowing eyes that looked at him and mocked. Hello, Jim. And again, <laughs> it's you, Jim. Spreading lawns and the huddled shapes of bushes people the night with strange phantoms. Little shadows raced about his feet and sometimes brushed against his legs with a soft, furry touch. Once, as he stepped down from a curb, he saw a scaly thing dissolve an instant later. And then Tommy's face, all by itself, floated eerily against the grey dark. The thing was thin and blurry, but the smile was there, and the sly eyes regarded him steadily. The face faded away and left only the glinting of the eyes. Before him, a shape had begun to dance, pausing until he almost caught up with it, then scurrying to get out of reach, to dance again and beckon. There was a certain mannerism about it that brought its identity to him. Wearily, he recognized Mary, her face cold in scorn. Why? And where was she leading him? Hello, Jim. Oh, it's you, Jim. Shadows and the gloomy fronts of houses, coldly staring, shadows on the lawn and hiding at the edges of trees, soft things which bumped his legs and a great shadow-like spread wings reaching out to engulf the whole of the town. Blurry white wisps of faces drifting just ahead. Tommy's and Mary's. Mary's and Tommy's. Above, there was a rustling as of bats. Below, there came a low and throaty sound, and the smells of fresh-cut grass and growing things were tinged with a perfume he could not define. A perfume as elusive as those faces which drifted ever before him. A perfume. 
Mary's. Mary's. Mary's perfume mingled with the smell of exotic tobacco. Exotic tobacco. Tommy's. The great dark cloud spread and spread, and the lamps became dim, and the shadow deepened and began to march jerkily beside him. At a distance, each shadow, stationary, until he came to it, coming up and marching with the rest, darker and darker, and then... No sounds at all. No sounds. Or smells. Just the thin wisp of a mocking smile. Gradually fading. Forever receding. Weakly, he leaned against the parapet of a little stone bridge behind the church and listened to the water saying, Oh, it's you, Jim. Hello, Jim. At the other end, there stood a dark, thick shadow. The thing with a slouch hat upon its head and a black cloak draped about it, which reached down to its buckled shoes. It was carefully braiding a rope, strand by strand. Lowry knew he would rest a little and then walk over the bridge to the man of darkness. Oh, it's you, Jim. Hello, Jim. Quiet, rippling voices, almost unheard, slowly fading. And now, there was nothing more of that smile. There was nothing in the sky but the vast shadow and the plaintive whimper of an evening wind. The street lamp threw a pale light upon him, and by its light he tried to see the water. The voices down there were scarcely whispers now, only a rippling murmur, a kind and soothing sound. He caught a glimpse of something white in the water and leaned a trifle farther, not particularly interested in the fact that it was a reflection of his own face in the black mirror surface below. He watched the image grow clearer, watched his own eyes and mouth take form. It was as if he was seeing himself down there, a self far more real than this self leaning against the cold stone. Idly, he beckoned to the image. It seemed to grow nearer. He beckoned again in experiment. It was nearer still. With sudden determination, he held out both hands to it. It was gone from the water but it was not gone. Jim Lowry stood up straight. He took a long, deep breath of fresh evening air and looked up at the stars in the sky. He turned and looked along the avenue and saw people strolling and enjoying the smell of fresh-cut grass. He looked across the bridge and saw old Billy Watkins leaning against the stone, puffing contentedly upon a pipe. With a feeling that was almost triumph, for all the weight of sorrow within him, Jim Lowry crossed the bridge and approached the night policeman. Oh, uh, hello, Professor Lowry. Hello, Billy. Nice night. Oh, yes, yes, Billy, a nice night. I want you to do something for me, Billy. Oh, anything, Jim. Come with me. Old Billy knocked the ashes from his pipe and silently fell in beside. Old Billy was a wise old fellow, he could feel Lowry's mood, and he said nothing to intrude upon it, merely walked along, smelling the growing things of spring. They walked for several blocks, and then Jim Lowry turned into the path at Tommy's house. The old mansion was unlighted and still, and seemed to be waiting for them. You should have a key to fit that door, Billy. Oh, yes, I've got one. Uh, it's a common lock. Old Billy turned the knob and fumbled for the hall light, turning it on and standing back to follow Lowry. Jim Lowry pointed at the hat rack in the hall and indicated a lady's bag which lay there beside a lady's hat. There was another hat there, a man's, trammeled, halfway between the hat rack and living room. It had initials in the band, J.L. Come with me, Billy said Jim Lowry in a quiet, controlled voice. 
As they passed the living room, old Billy saw the stumps of a broken chair and an upset ashtray. Jim Lowry held the kitchen door open and turned on the light. The window was broken there. A mewling sound came from somewhere, and Jim Lowry opened the door to the cellar. With steady, slow steps, he descended a short flight of stairs through newly swung strands of cobwebs. A Persian cat, with a half-mad look, bolted past them and fled out of the house. Jim fumbled for the basement light. For a moment, it seemed he would not turn it on, but that was only for a moment. The naked bulb flooded the basement and filled it with sharp, swinging shadows. A crude hole had been dug in the middle of the dirt floor, and a shovel was abandoned beside it. Jim Lowry took hold of the light cord and lifted it so that the rays would stream into the coal bin. An axe, black with blood, pointed its handle at them. From the coal protruded a white something. Old Billy stepped to the dark, dusty pile and pushed some of the lumps away. A small avalanche rattled, disclosing the smashed and hacked face of Tommy Williams. To his right, head thrown back, staring eyes fixed upon the stringers, and blood-caked arm outflung, lay the body of Mary, Jim Lowry's wife. Old Billy looked for several minutes at Jim Lowry, and then Lowry spoke. I did it Saturday afternoon. A Saturday night I came back here to find the evidence I had left, my hat, and dispose of the bodies. Sunday, I came again. I had to climb in the window. I'd lost the key. Jim Lowry sank down upon a box and hid his face in his hands. I don't know why I did it. Oh, God, forgive me, I don't know why. I found her here, hiding, after I'd found a hat. Everything was whirling, and I couldn't hear what they kept screaming at me. And I killed them. A sob shook him. I don't know why. I don't know why she was here. I don't know why I could not reason. Cerebral malaria. Jealous madness. Old Billy moved a little. And the coal pile shifted and rattled. Tommy's arm was bared. It seemed to thrust itself toward Lowry. And in the coal fist clenched a scrap of paper as though mutely offering an explanation, even in death. Old Billy removed the paper and read, Tommy Allsport, next week is Jim's birthday and I want to surprise him with a party. I'll come over Saturday afternoon and you can help me make up the list of his friends and give me your expert advice on the demon room. Oh, don't let him know a word of this. Regards, Mary. Somewhere, high above, there seemed to hang a tinkle of laughter. High, amused laughter, gloating and mocking and evil. Of course, though, it was probably just the sigh of wind whining below the cellar floor. Copyright 1990, Bridge Audio.